Thomas Charles Murray Jr., TJ to those who loved him most, was a 23-year-old from Huntsville, Texas. He was a Little League umpire and had survived leukemia. Just after midnight on October 19, 2011, TJ got kicked out of a bar in Spring, Texas. Video then shows TJ walking alone, headed south from the building. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. If the name of this episode is not familiar to you, you can find its origin in a multitude of places. For me, it comes from the film Full Metal Jacket. Joker, the main character, is asked how he as a soldier can carry an M16, but also wear a peace symbol on his uniform. Joker responds, kinda, with a title that I've chosen for TJ's disappearance. What it means is that within all of us, there are contradictions. We are both passive and aggressive, outspoken and silent, kind and rude. For example, the man who in public is the sweetest human you ever want to meet, but behind the scenes, he abuses his kids, his wife, and the family dog. Likewise, and in contrast, the woman who in private is the most understanding person you ever want to meet. But in her public work, she is as demanding a boss as has ever been created. We are all animals of extremes. And due to our higher reasoning abilities, we are able to plan what we will do and what face we will show for whatever particular situation. Those qualities make us both the best hunters and the best caregivers on earth. Well, in the disappearance of T.J. Murray, he was known as being one of the nicest guys around, helping young athletes and being a mentor to his youngest brother. Yet, on the night of his disappearance, T.J. slapped an innocent young woman in front of a crowd of people, for seemingly no reason. Then he disappeared, and we're left to figure out if this case has anything to do with the duality of a man. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. T.J. Murray had a rough start to his life. He developed leukemia at a very young age and fought it for years before it went into remission when T.J. was 10 years old. However, the disease left signs behind. The hair on TJ's head never grew in fully, and despite his brothers being six feet tall, TJ was only 5'6". Yet, these things didn't deter him. TJ became an accomplished baseball player and long-distance runner. And, after a rough first year at one college, TJ transferred to another where things seemed to be going much better, with him living away from home and paying his own bills. So, on October 18th, 2011, TJ umpired two Little League games, then met up with his longtime friend, Jeff, at the Spring, Texas bar on the rocks. Leaving TJ's vehicle there, they took Jeff's car to another place, the 19th hole. Then the two went to another Spring, Texas bar, Rookies. Around this time, TJ talked to his father. Everything seemed fine. However, only a couple hours later, while Jeff was in the restroom, TJ slapped a woman at Rookies. Because of this, TJ got kicked out. Jeff was allowed to remain. Upon getting put out on the street, TJ called his father and said, I love you, Daddy, then hung up. 
His father says TJ sounded like he was on dope. Video then shows TJ walking alone away from the bar, headed south. He was never seen again. Surprisingly, two days later, TJ's phone was found by the side of the road north of Rookies, the opposite direction from which TJ walked that night. To this day, there is no explanation for this. Over the last nine years, a lot of theories and conjecture have circulated around the Spring, Texas area concerning TJ's disappearance. All of these involve some version of foul play, either by strangers or people who were in the bar that night. However, our job is to look at the information objectively to determine what most likely occurred. And that process starts by trying to answer these three questions. Number one, does it make sense that TJ's friend Jeff stuck around rookies after TJ got kicked out, given that the two went to that bar in Jeff's car? Number two, what are we to make of a call that was made from rookies in which someone said, TJ's brother better get down here or TJ is going to get his ass kicked? And number three, how should we treat recent news just revealed in 2020 in which the current detective responsible for the investigation said that TJ and Jeff had a run-in at another bar earlier that night? TJ's family believes he was the victim of foul play due to the slapping incident. The guest for this episode is TJ's father, Tom Murray. Unfound News I apologize about not being able to publish this episode last Friday, January 1st, as I expected to do. Dad decided he wanted to go back to Pennsylvania on the spur of the moment. This caused me to not have enough time to put this long and complex episode together. If it helps, I missed a disc golf tournament due to this as well. The good news, Dad is now at his home, and I'm back at mine. Next, Dr. Telesco contacted me at the beginning of this week to ask me to appear with her on a webinar on Monday, January 25th, 2021, that will play on YouTube. I, of course, said yes immediately. Grace has once again picked out the disappearance we will be discussing. Which one is it? I'll let you know when we get closer to that date. Finally, I hope all of you had a wonderful holiday season. Here's to hoping 2021 isn't as crazy as 2020 was. I hope you make all of your dreams come true over the next 12 months. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, Deezer, Facebook, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us on our podcast channel for the Unfound live show. All of you can talk with me and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Tammy. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. And do not forget the website, theunfoundpodcast.com. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the father of Thomas Charles Murray Jr., Tom Murray. Tom, welcome to Unfound. Well, thank you, Ed. Appreciate you having me on. You're very welcome, and the listeners should know that I've talked to Tom quite a few times before we're doing this interview. Uh, he is a former Western Pennsylvania resident like I am, so we've had a, a lot to share in uh, that area of our lives, and it's been a real pleasure. So, Tom, once again, welcome to the program, and let's just start here. Uh, we were just talking about this before we started this interview. Let's just talk about your family as a whole. Uh, you have uh, four boys. Um, of course, starting with uh, TJ, who we'll be talking about today. Why don't you talk uh, a little bit about 
uh, your four sons and you know the family dynamic, maybe going back you know to 2011, if not beforehand. Um, they were very uh, outdoorsy uh, young men. Um, the four boys, the three. We were all two years apart, and then Sam, there was a gap, and um, but they were all very close, loved athletics, football, baseball, like to hunt, fish, mm -hmm. and do all that. We were a very outdoorsy family, and uh, the boy's mother was also, she loved to go be outside and and uh, partake in the fishing and, and all that stuff also. So... Uh, Put it this way, we, we never sat in the house. So there was always, always something to do with the with the with the boys. Yeah. So. Neat. Neat. So four boys, uh and the listeners should know I've gotten to talk to uh um Janelle as well, the mother of your four boys as well, um, both on the phone and through Messenger. So going outside and of course in Texas there's a lot of things to do. We were just talking about that as well. Fishing, hunting, etc. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. They were always involved in sports, you know, baseball, all, all, all of them played baseball from age seven all the way till mm -hmm. through high school and all that. So uh, it was a very entertaining family to be around and, and uh, yeah, wasn't, there was no time for boredom, put it that way. It doesn't, it always doesn't sound like it. Do. Yeah. So well, TJ was your youngest. And how your uh, was your oldest? Excuse me. TJ was your oldest, yes. and Sam is your youngest. How many years difference was there? There. It's thirteen, fourteen, wow. fourteen years. Okay. Yeah, fourteen years. Wow. Okay. And uh, how did every how did the boys get along? Would you say that uh, were they typical brothers? They fight a lot, or would you say they were close? How would you explain it? The three uh, when they were younger. I mean, obviously there was, you know, a little bit of arguing going on and, and uh, friendly banter going down. But, no, they were pretty close, you know, especially when they graduated high school and and all three of them were going to college. Mm -hmm. You know, TJ went to three different colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and But then James, the, the second, second oldest, um, they kind of, you know, they had different ideas or different things in life that they went their own separate way. But mm -hmm. TJ and the youngest, Sam, they had a bond that was very special. And uh, that's that's really affected Sam to this day. Yeah. Uh, he, misses his, he misses his big brother because he right. looked up to him. He went everywhere with him. TJ would take him to the ball field. He'd take him to go get ice. You know, he just did what, what a big brother – yeah. Should do for their little brother. Right. So, and what you're, and, uh, and what you're saying is, is that TJ, when he disappeared, he was 23. So Sam would have been 10 years old. Yes. Wow. I think actually he was nine. He was going to be right. 10. And uh, wow. Yeah. So that that uh, I'm, I'm telling you, you, you ask Sam today, and it's still. Uh, right. You know, he cries when it's his birthday. He cries mm -hmm. on the day that TJ disappeared. You know, mm -hmm. and so it's a. Uh, Tough. Yeah, no one, no, no little brother should have to go through all that, which there are probably thousands and thousands of cases that, you know, the same as with my son. But yeah, uh, yeah. So you, Sam, would be eighteen or nineteen now, like eighteen, nineteen years old. He's, he's twenty. He's, oh. he's just turned twenty. Okay. All right. So. Okay. So let's. All right. Thank you for all of that. Let's move on to TJ exclusively. You've talked about. Um, how he was into sports, like your other sons were, into hunting. Uh, maybe just about him uh, exclusively. What made him unique? Maybe his personality or something, you know, in contrast to your other sons. What, what was it about TJ yeah, he, being the he, oldest one? He was such a caring, caring person. Even though he had his uh, uh, other side to him, you know, but he was mm -hmm. he was a genuine, caring, loving boy mm -hmm. and uh it's he you know he had leukemia when he was six and mm. battled that for all those years and finally was cured but his hair never came back so he had like an inferiority complex mm. about his hair mm. and his brothers were taller than him so 
you know, there were some self-confidence issues mm-hmm. that that he ended up overcoming. He became, he really got into running, and uh, that, I guess, was his way to relieve, you know, his stress. Mm-hmm. And he loved umpiring. He got into umpiring after he quit playing baseball when he was, uh, when he went to college just to make some side money. And uh, mm-hmm. that became a big big thing for him yeah. was to uh you know umpire these young little kids and i'd go watch him umpire and he'd be you know helping the catcher hey do this this it was it was just cool to cool to watch yeah. and see yeah okay but, this leukemia um obviously we know people that die from it that is very common so he was able to recover from that i must have been a heck of a fight for him yeah, he had that ALL T cell, and uh, you know you'd go down there to Texas Children's, and um, you'd see these parents, and then you'd go back for more treatments. You'd see new parents, you know, all the time, and you just yeah. and it, your heart just broke because here's someone that was almost five years cancer free, and it came back, and then they ended up passing away. So yeah. you never. If you looked at TJ, you you would say he knew, but he didn't know. You know what I mean? That there was a chance. Yeah, that it come back, yeah. And, you know, when you had the tubes in your, you know, and, you know, sticking out of you, you know, why is this happening to me? And while his two little brothers are out playing baseball and he had to be pretty much quarantined, mm. you know, with a mask and all that stuff. But, hey, he battled and, and fought through it and mm-hmm. at age... I guess it was age ten. They they deemed him cured. Wow! That is it could come back like I could get it or you could get it. You know that's yeah. his chances were, were, and he never had any other issues except for it. all that radiation and the chemo stunted his, you know, hair growth mm-hmm. and and his height. Mm-hmm. And he like I said, he was he was not a, you know, I'm I'm five ten, but he mm-hmm. was I don't know he might have been five 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 six. Okay. And his third brother was six six two. Wow. James is five ten, you know, wow. and and Sam's six one. And uh so you yeah. know, but Okay. Well he survived though. And at the time of his disappearance yes. I, I guess that that's called remission, right? He was in remission for thirteen yes. years or something. Yep. Okay. All right, well, good for him. And I'm, I'm sure yes. that was very difficult on both you and his mother, Janelle. So that was yes, good. it was a trying time. And, uh, okay. Very trying. Yeah. So he gets through that. Uh, how does he do in school? Uh, you, you've already talked about him going to college, so I'm guessing he graduated from high school. Um, you know, what was – Yeah, please. He went to Stephen F. Yeah, up in Nacogdoches, mm-hmm. and that – I think that was a – he, he found the art of partying, <laughs> and uh, school school wasn't a major deal. So he he he, he lasted there, I guess six months, one semester, yeah. and then he figured out what was, and then so he went to Corpus Christi A and M, and that's when he started getting serious. I say serious. That's when he started studying and and going to class and. And, and doing the things he needed to do. And then he stayed down there for a year, I think a year. Mm-hmm. And then he went to Sam Houston, uh, where his littler brother went to. Okay. And uh, so they were both there at Sam. Okay. And how far, <laughs> and and, and um, we should be clear, what uh, town did uh, TJ grow up in? Where did you, Where did you live at the time? Maybe you still live there. What town did you all it's, live in? It was a it was a Spring Conroe address, mm-hmm. but the the place that we lived in was uh, really the Oak Ridge area. They they call it Oak Ridge. That's where I taught and my ex wife taught. That I taught at the high school and she taught at the elementary. Oh, okay. And um, so all their lives they were in that area. Okay. We we moved three different times, but it was all in the same. You know, same within five, six miles of of the place. Okay. And I I currently live in Magnolia, which is about 10 miles away from 
where my kids grew up. Okay. So when he went off to college, how far was uh, like you already mentioned Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin. You've mentioned Sam Houston. How far are those uh, colleges? I'm sure most people have heard of those. Uh, from where you all grew up, did he go far away or, or what? Stephen Stephen F. Nacogdoches was about two and a half hours. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Corpus Christi was three, almost four hours, and Sam Houston was forty five minutes. Okay, so a couple so far away, and then away. one certainly, I guess, within driving distance. Okay. Yes. All right. So I guess he graduated from high school, had good enough grades. Uh, to get, I mean, how was his education? What kind of uh, student was he, at least in high school? Uh, uh, he was a B, B student. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he was never failed classes or anything like that, except for that freshman year in college. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, he he was, uh, you know, he was. Okay. He had so many. You know, he worked, went to school, ran track and cross country, played football, played baseball. You know, throughout mm-hmm. the four years, he didn't play football for four full years. But mm-hmm. uh, baseball, I think he was two years. So, but he was in a bad car accident and uh, rolled my truck oh, and my. had to be life flighted. Um, and that was pretty much the end of wow. of all that with him playing any of those. You know, he could still run and all that, but they had to do a total knee job on him. Oh, my. Uh, dislocated the other leg, so man, he's a, he he did through a that. lot. I mean, you're, I mean, well, the way yeah. you're portraying, I mean, leukemia, and then a bad car wreck. I mean, uh, this young man uh, was through a lot, Tom. Yeah, he, yeah, he went, he went through his childhood and teenage years were not easy on him. Yeah. What happened in the car wreck? Was that something I just have to ask? Was that his fault, or or what happened? Yeah, he was. I, I, he took my truck. He was going to buy uh, tickets for uh, um, Leonard Skinner. They were going on sale. He had his flip flops on, and I I don't know if you know what sand burrs, grass burrs are, but he was in my my truck. And I had I just got back from the country, and there was grass burrs in my the floorboard. And I guess when he had his shoe, his sandal, one of them got in, and he looked down to get it off of his foot, and mm. he swerved, oh, and yeah. that's when he went in, hit the ditch, and did a roll. Oh yeah. The only thing that saved him was where that it was about a five foot ditch. It rained real hard the day before. And when the truck landed on top of him, it, his body mm-hmm. sunk into that mud. Wow. And so, I mean, they had to get the airbags, you know, to lift the – and right. his leg, one leg was caught in the steering wheel. They had to cut all that out. And, and uh, I was I was there, and, mm-hmm. you know, there's my son's underneath the car. I was there before the ambulance and everything else came. And um, it was terrible, that, actually. Right. That was uh, wow. I still have oh. visions of that. Every mm-hmm. time I drive, I don't live over there anymore. But every time I drive down that road, it's like, oh God, this is where it was. Mm-hmm. How old was he? But he survived. Yeah, how, how? Uh, eighteen. I think eighteen. Okay. 18 Seventeen, years. somewhere. Yes. Okay. Know, these last ten years, my mind is. I forget more than I remember. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he has leukemia. He recovers from that. 18 years old. He has this bad car wreck, unfortunately ending his uh, sports career uh, in, in baseball, maybe some other activities. And But he ended up graduating from high school. He goes to college. I think like a lot of college kids, maybe he partied a little too much, changed schools, not unusual. But at the time of his disappearance, he was going to college, right? Yes, he was at Sam Houston. Sam Houston. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a bit. All right, so we got a, a good idea about uh, who TJ is, his interests, and th- uh, things that he uh, did in his life, and these things that he overcame. Uh, let's move on to uh, some items that are, are going to be very relevant to uh, his disappearance. Now, just some things uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, just in general, let's first talk about Jeff Bowden. Um, he's, his name is going to be very, uh, mentioned very um, prominently 
um, from now on. In fact, I got to talk to Jeff uh, because he was with uh, TJ the night this disappearance occurred. But just in general, uh, who is Jeff? How did TJ and, and Jeff know each other? And in fact, you've told me that you actually coach coached Jeff in high school. Why don't you talk a little bit about Jeff and how you know him, how TJ knows him? Yeah, I, I knew Jeff since, I guess, seven. Well, TJ and Jeff played baseball, Little League baseball together, I guess, when they were 10 or 11 years old. Jeff's dad coached the team, and and so I've known Jeff for, for a pretty long time. Mm. And then I had the uh, the opportunity, and I coached him in track and cross country, which he was a very good track and cross country runner. Mm. And that's where TJ and him uh, ended up becoming friends was through the cross country team and mm -hmm. Jeff was always outgoing uh was a good good student uh good young man mm -hmm. um, okay and so all right so they got to be friends with you of course we know that they were hanging out on the night that uh TJ disappeared but did they hang out like in high school as well were they like Friday night Saturday night going out together do you even remember yes, that yes yeah, sometimes they would hang out. I mean, you know, go to CC's Pizza and or the movies or whatever, do stuff like that. I mean, I don't think it was an everyday, you know, hangout. Um, okay. You know, I was coaching at the time too, so I wasn't home a lot when that was, uh, you know, during the week because we were always out doing whatever with the coaching staff. So. Um, okay. But yeah, I would have to say they were they were pretty good friends. All right, and would would you say that Jeff at times had been over to your house, maybe in high school? Not too often. Okay. I, I don't recall that at all. Um, but okay, you know when we would do the coaching thing, you know, with the team and all that, they would always hang out together. Right. right. Okay. All right, and in the way you remember, were they in the same grade, or was TJ a year older, a year younger? Do you remember? Uh, TJ was, God Almighty, I'm going to say they were the same age. Same age, all right, so maybe they graduated uh, high school. Uh, I could time. be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure they were they were within a year of each other, to say that. Okay, so. great. All right, so they, they're friends going back to high school. Of course, we know this is 2011, so maybe you know, five years into 23, maybe 18, five years after they graduated high school, they're still hanging out. We'll talk about how they ended up uh, meeting up uh, that night for sure. Let's move on to this. Being that um, you know people who I'm sure have looked up your son's disappearance before listening to this episode just to kind of get the general idea of what happened, he was driving your truck that night. You've already stated that he drove one of your other trucks and wrecked it. But uh, was that a common issue for him? He had his own vehicle, you've told me. Was it very common for him to be driving your truck? Uh, not, I wouldn't say common, but he has borrowed my truck. Like if he was going out on a, a date, you know, he didn't want his because it was an older car, he would take my pickup. I never had a problem with it, you know, just mm -hmm. as long as you, know, you were responsible and, right. and weren't drinking and driving my vehicle. I was... I was good with it. So, yeah, he has borrowed my truck, like my other children have borrowed my vehicle to mm -hmm. use. Okay. And uh, he did borrow it that, that night. Okay. And so I guess what I'm saying is even though he had wrecked your truck five years before, that that was not something that scared you off from him driving your truck again? No, not at all. Not at all. Accidents okay. happen. Okay. Well, being that you brought it up going out on dates, did TJ have a girlfriend? Did he – you don't have to mention her name, but – uh, you know, he's going to school, high school. You know, did he have a girlfriend or at the time? Or? He had, he had several. It was never, never a, uh, you know, year, year, two years. He had, you know, I don't know. You, he just, he would just not stick with one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He, it move, it just go out on dates, and you know, there was a couple girls that he, that they hung around together all the time. You know, as a group, and uh, never, never was serious, serious with uh, anyone, you know, like when he started college and all that. Okay. So. All right. So um, there's that situation. You know, every, uh, you know, a lot of young guys uh, maybe moving around and having a lot of female friends. 
Let's talk about a, a couple other things regarding, once again, just to set some of this up for uh, when we talk about the details of the disappearance. These couple bars that we're going to talk about, uh, rookies on the rocks there in Spring, Texas, and I guess there's also one called the 19th Hole that may play a, a part in our discussion as well. Do you know these are places? Is, are these places that TJ would go often, or do you, do you have any idea? of a bar person from what I gathered. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, I knew, like, he, he, when he asked me if he could use my truck because he was going to uh, go out with Jeff that night, mm -hmm. and I said, yeah, no problem. I said, just, you know, make sure you meet me at school the next day, and and we'll switch vehicles then. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's how that Okay. You know, went down, and I said, "Yeah, that's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that at all." Okay. So, and maybe, maybe since you are a local to that area, how would you describe these bars? Uh, are they more like uh, family places, or are they more dive bars? Where do they fall on that scale, in your opinion? Rookies, rookies bar was more of a up class type. That's the way it started off. Okay. And then it became a a uh, young people's crowd. Okay. You know, it used to be the the older clientele would go in there in the beginning, and then as it a couple of years went by, more younger people, twenty one, you know, the thirty would be going in there. Mm -hmm. On the rocks, I forget what I was never in. On the rocks, there was a, it was a name something else before that. I forget what the name was. That was pretty much your go in there if you want to, you know, have drinks and uh, wasn't much of a food food type mm -hmm. place. Um, but they had, I think they had a couple pool tables and dart boards and stuff like that. 19th hole, you were there. They had very good wings and smoky environment. And that was pretty much the uh, old local people hangout. And they'd have bands like on Friday and Saturday nights. So then mm -hmm. the younger crowd would come in there on Friday and Saturday nights, but overall, rookie—I mean, uh, 19th hole was more of a uh, the old locals came in. Everybody knew everybody. And okay, I guess type that, of old bar. All right. So what I'm not hearing is none of these are what we, you know, a cliche. None of these are like a biker bar or anything like that. Where the way you have, no, no. Okay, and no. these. All right, and these are three places that we know that Jeff and TJ uh, went that night. And, uh, in, in fact, I know in our previous, previous conversations, the 19th hole did not come up, but then I watched this video that I sent to you regarding the investigator, and he had talked about the, them being at the 19th hole. So um, maybe we'll, we'll discuss that uh, in, in a little bit. Now, one more uh, item, a couple more items that I want to, once again, just setting this up for what we're going to discuss for his disappearance. It will not be using her real name um, for a few different reasons uh, that the listeners do not have to worry about. But there is uh, this young woman, uh, Amanda, that we're going to be talking about uh, her in a bit. We'll not be using her real name. But just in general... You know who her real name. I know what her real name is, and I think a lot of locals in the area know her name, but we're going to keep it out of this uh, national, international program. Uh, just in general, who is Amanda? You have told me that TJ and she uh, knew each other from high school, but just in general, even before this night, if I had mentioned her name to you, how well would you have known her? What did you know about her and her family? Well, I, I knew her just through my, my children. And um, that her mom and dad, we probably two or three blocks away from where we lived. They lived in a place called White Oak Estates um, is where we were living. And so I knew they were acquaintances going to, you know, high school parties or gatherings or whatever. But her mom owned a bail bonds okay. company. And so that's how... Um, Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember if it was TJ or if it was James, but one of them got in trouble and had to use the bond service wow. to to get them out. And that that's who 
was recommended to use oh, okay. was that that, that bail bond company. So right. that's that's as far as I go with knowing the family. I personally uh, met the mom and met Amanda mm-hmm. by doing that, going in, and here's my restitution money, okay. get him out of jail. Okay. And um, so that's about as far as okay my personal you know knowledge of the, of of those people all right did you did you happen to know how well t j and Amanda knew each other uh before this particular night I would have to say, you know just from being in high school and all that that they him her and james i mean t j and James knew her pretty good okay. you know knew her pretty well right and I'm no, not saying they hung out every day or but they they knew who who mm-hmm. was who okay and, you know, my perception, I will tell you, Tom, being that I did get to talk to Amanda on the phone, and I appreciate I called her and she called me back, and we got to have a good conversation about what she remembers from that night. Uh, she did say her age uh, during our conversation. She volunteered that. And my perception is she was a couple years younger than TJ, so it might have been your second – she might have been in class with your second son, You're not not TJ, maybe. Right, right, but, you know – Nine through twelve are in the school. Lunch classes are mixed, so I mean, mm-hmm. I know he knew her from from high school. Um, but yeah, I, I believe you're right on that. That James and and her were already in the same grade. Okay, very good. Let's move on to one more thing, and I do not want to hit this too hard, but we do talk about these issues on the program should they happen to arise. And the only reason we talk about it is because we know that sometimes these types of issues can lead to disappearances. Uh, was TJ into any drugs, have any addictions, um, any anything like that? Because uh, it just came up in conversation that, you know, he might have been selling some drugs on the side or uh, doing illegal drugs, smoking marijuana, et cetera. Uh, can you say anything about any of that? Yeah, I, I know he was. He, he would smoke pot. I know. I know that was going to. As of for him selling, I heard mm-hmm. that he was selling pot, but I don't. I never physically saw or knew that. That's what the mm-hmm. officers were telling me. Well, he was into this. He was into that. I said, well, I I mm-hmm. didn't know anything about that. Okay. So if he was, shame on him. But I know I know he would partake in in uh, smoking marijuana, but I don't know about pills or mm-hmm. cocaine or any of that stuff. Uh, I would have to say no, but who knows? Okay. What so about I'm your? Not, I'm not rolling that out. All right. What about your other two sons, James? And you haven't mentioned your third son. Did they? Oh. I know there's James, TJ, Sam, and. Will. Will, Will's okay. Third. Yeah, Will, okay. Thank you for that. Um, did they too, being that they were within a few years of TJ's disappearance, did they ever mention anything to you about TJ maybe well, doing Will, something? Please. Will died six months after TJ uh-huh. disappeared. He drowned. Um, so, you know, that, mm-hmm. that affected him. Yeah. You know, James. It still messes with James to this mm-hmm. day, which it does all of us. Uh, yeah. Right. But, you know, James James find a different avenue of how to ease the pain by drugs. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, so it it you know yeah. it affects people in different ways. It's, it's a shame that's the way it it went for him. But um, all right. I guess what I'm asking you, Tom, is being that the police did say this to you, I guess after TJ disappeared, before and I, you know you have my deepest sympathies uh, regarding Will, and I, I of course uh, knew about that and uh, read about it. But maybe in those months after TJ disappeared, but before Will uh, died, drowned, and James, did they ever say to you, you know what, we think TJ might have been doing things he shouldn't have been doing? Did your two older sons, who might have been in a position to know that, Say, ever say that to you? Not once. Not once. Okay. Not one time. Okay. Not one time. All right. I mean, that was never a. You know, and I, I understand how the 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 police 
think. Yeah. But that never crossed my mind whatsoever. Okay. You know, that I was like, oh, God, this could be a, a bad a drug deal gone bad. That never crossed my mind. Okay. And to this day, it has it not crossed my mind. It has not crossed your mind. Okay, thank you for that. So overall, uh, at the time of TJ's disappearance, to your knowledge, and even if you've found anything since, anybody having any problems with TJ Murray at all? Anybody r- look looking him up, looking to you know hunt him down for some reason, anything like that? Have you ever heard anything like that at all? Nothing that I'm aware of. I haven't okay. heard anything. Like I said, he was a a lot of people loved him. I mean, mm-hmm. he was a he was a no, he was he had the, I, I don't want to say the small man syndrome. He could have at times. You know, sometimes his attitude was he was six five. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but um, he was pretty even keeled kid. Now he would fire up and flip off the handle like all people, you know, do. But no, he was just a lovable kid. Okay. For all the crap that he went through, uh, he was just a lovable kid. Right. Okay. So let's and and just so we know one more thing, being that he was going to school at the time of his disappearance, was he living at home? Was he living, I guess, at Sam Houston? Was he living on campus? Where was uh, TJ living at the time? He, he had an apartment off of uh, 19 up in Huntsville. Uh, that okay. most most of the people there were, you know, college college bound at that uh, apartment complex that he was staying at. Okay. It was a nice nice complex. It was a one bedroom. He had a one bedroom. Mm-hmm. Okay. So no roommates. No roommates, nothing. Just him by himself. No. Right. Okay. And how far is that from um where he disappeared? On the rocks, rookies, how far away? Uh, probably forty five minutes. Okay. So probably like thirty miles. Okay. So let's move up to that uh, day, October 18th, 2011. And how was it, being that he wasn't living at home, how was it arranged that he ended up um, driving your truck? Did you fi- switch cars with him? How did it end up that he got your truck? Yeah, I was living in Conroe at the time, and um, we talked earlier, I guess the night before. He said, hey, Dad, I'm going out Friday do you mind if, if I use your vehicle? And I said, no. I said, just as long as you're not drinking and driving my vehicle. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he came. He said, I got to umpire uh, two games tonight. And then after that, Jeff and I are going to go out. We're going to meet some people. And I said, yeah, not a problem. So I guess it was like 3 o'clock. He came to my house. We talked and and then he left about four four thirty to go to the ballparks, which were down in that same area as rookies and on the rocks at nineteenth hole, mm-hmm. uh maybe a mile from there. And so that's where he went. He I had his car and um and if we were supposed to exchange the next day he was going to come to school, drop it off when he woke up, okay. and then would switch, and he would go on his way. Did it surprise you, being that he described what they were going to be doing, that he wanted to get your truck for that? It seems to me, if he's just meeting a buddy of his, that he could have just used his own vehicle. I mean, did that surprise you at the time, or in retrospect, does that seem a little unusual? <laughs> no, I, I just, you know, he, I figured if he met a girl or he was if they were meeting a girl he didn't want to have his <laughs> gold older old mobile car he wanted something to you know help his image that's okay. that's just me thinking that so, okay you know i i completely understood okay i again i as uh, a guy as a young man at one time i completely <laughs> understand that as well uh i just have to ask because it seems like he was just meeting a buddy of his that he had known for since high school and they were going to be bar hopping. It seems like uh, an odd request to to ask for your father's right. nice truck. That's uh, that's all I'm asking, you know. Right. No, it, I mean it didn't. I just figured something. They were going to be doing something, and it, you know, I don't even know what vehicle Jeff had. I, right. I, I'd be lying if I even said what he he was driving. Okay. But it never left that first bar after there. So I mean, 
I bet mm-hmm. you he didn't put 15 miles on my truck. Okay. All right. All right. So as you've already explained, he comes to your house, he gets your truck, you see him. He goes and umpires these two little league games. And then what happens next? Once again, the way you understand it, and we're going to be doing this uh, from your point of view, Tom, going back. So we're going to okay. you know, skip over to some of the details, and we'll go through them the way you found them out after the fact. So what do you understand about after um, TJ umpires these uh, games? What does he do? After, after the game, obviously he changes clothes out of his umpire uniform, and – they go to On the Rocks. Okay. And that's where my truck stayed. Okay. Then I talked to him, and I can't remember if I called him, he called me. I think I called him. It was like 10, 1030, and I don't even know if I called him, why I even called him, but just to check on him and... He was fine. He said, Dad, I I mean, I haven't even had a beer yet. I said, look, if you're drinking, I do not want you driving my truck. You understand? Mm-hmm. He said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that was that was it. It was a short conversation. I said, all right, be safe, you know, uh, enjoy yourself and all that. And then that was the end of that till 1237. My phone rings, and it's TJ. And he is out of his mind, like he is totally messed up, more than drunk. Wow. And he said, I I love you, Daddy. And then that was the end of that conversation. And that was what the the detective told me. That was at 1237. I couldn't remember. Mm -hmm. I thought it was like 12 o'clock. But the detective told me it was at 12.37, and that was when TJ went off camera also outside front of rookies. All right, we're certainly going to talk about that video. So just to recap this, so he meets uh, Jeff. They meet at uh, On the Rocks, and you're, just to be clear, your truck stays there for the rest of the night until you find it the next day. Correct. All right, and so what happens then is that Jeff meets uh, TJ there. They use his vehicle whatever kind of car Jeff is driving, and then they go to these other places. You talk to TJ yeah. at roughly 10.30. Let's just call it 10.30 to make it easy. 10.30, okay. maybe you called him. He called you. Everything seems fine. He's, he sounds clear-headed, just like regular old TJ. And then a couple hours later, like you said, at 12.37, he calls you. Uh, you, I guess you go, hey, TJ, what's up? And he doesn't even say, you know, doesn't ask you any questions. It's just those four words, I love you, Daddy, and yes. that was it. That was it. Wow. That was completely – so now I'm in a deal with – I got my young son sleeping in the other room. There's no one else there. Mm-hmm. In hindsight, I should have woke him up and said, get in the car. We're going to look for your brother, and I didn't do that. And that haunts me till today. But mm-hmm. um, did so you, did you try? Was, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, he's yeah. pretty trashed. Go, Jeff will get him home, or you know, go go wherever the, he was going to go. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was it. Did you try calling him back? Did you try texting him back at that point? I realize you say in retrospect you should you should have done. Easy to say <laughs> that I'd now. Be lying if I'd be lying if I told you I didn't or if I did. I, I have Can't remember. no recollection of – I know I probably tried the next day because who, whoever found that phone, they mm-hmm. they dialed – because I think I was labeled in TJ's phone as dad. Mm-hmm. So they called me. That's how I ended up finding TJ's phone. That person that had it <clears throat> called me. Okay. And said, hey, I found this phone. And that was, hell, I'm going to say two days later. Okay. Maybe. Might have been that very next night, but I, I think it was two days after that. Okay. So, and All right, and we will we will be getting a little more deep into that. But just to give you, uh, maybe give the listeners an idea, uh, I'm not a drinker. I've never been a drinker. Uh, you know, I've never been drunk. I've never had a buzz. It's just not something that I've never gone into. It's not for religious reasons or anything else. Just never was my thing. But for TJ, 
what kind of what you say, let's say he was drunk. What kind of drunk was he? Was he an angry drunk? Was he one of these guys that starts telling everybody he loves them and laughing and everything? Do you even happen to know what kind of drunk your son was? <laughs> no, I, I would have to say a combination of all. I've mm -hmm. only seen him uh, buzzed one or two times. And mm -hmm. one time he wanted to fight, and the next time he was just laughing and you know, mm -hmm. and cutting up and uh, that. But this was more of a, I, I, just, this is me saying this. Yeah. It, but this wasn't, this wasn't a drunk. This was, Wow. he was on something, is okay. what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Because he, I mean, of course, he was only probably 130 pounds, so it wouldn't take much alcohol to get him you know, mm -hmm. to that point of, but it sounded like this was way more than he had too many drinks. All right, so what you're saying, this this wasn't alcohol that might have been in his mind. It was something else, possibly. That's what I'm saying. I don't know, you know, I just, that's just what I was thinking. How you go from that to that quick mm -hmm. being incoherent. Okay. You know? All right. Um, all right, and you you would know your son best. None of us, of course, heard that phone call. You were the only one that uh, heard the phone call, so you're best at making the best assessment, and you probably are in the best position to do that. But you, your opinion nine years later is that this does not did not sound like TJ was drunk. It sounded like maybe he had just. I'm just going to throw that out there, but he had been flipped something, or maybe he had taken something that wasn't yes. alcohol. Okay. All right, so that was uh, 1237. That's very early on October 19th, uh, very, you know, 37 minutes into October 19th. So, but the plan, I guess you're thinking, is still for him to return your truck that next day. So why don't you just go now, go through that next day. Uh, you go to work. Uh, you are a teacher. You're expecting TJ to show up with your truck. Uh, why don't you describe that next day? Well, I have uh, a conference period like 10 o'clock in the morning, and actually it's like 10 20. And I come out thinking my truck's going to be there. I was going to go get something to eat, and his car was there, and that's when the panic set in. Mm -hmm. Something was going down. So I got in his car, and I drove over to – I didn't know about the 19th hole okay. at that time. So I went over to Rookies, and there was nothing, and I went over to On the Rocks, and I saw my truck. I went, okay, so he must be with Jeff. So I pulled his car in. I had my extra set of keys. I got in the truck, and I went back to work. And I was trying to call TJ then, but nothing. There was no nothing. I'm like, okay, he's, he's tying. He must have really tied one on. Mm -hmm. So after work... I don't know who I got with. I, I, I can't remember, but we went looking, and and I finally called the police. And then they said, look, he's 23 years old. He's probably shacked up with somebody. Uh -huh. Well, then after two days went by, I kept calling and calling. And finally, when I got that call for the phone, and, man, I'm having a hard time if that was the next night or the night after. I can't remember if it was the 19th or the 20th. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking the 20th is when I got that call. So I had, I don't know what boy I had with me that we went to this apartment complex to get TJ's phone. And then the next day I called the police again and said, look, this person had the phone. This is where the phone was found. And... Mm -hmm. That's when they put out the search. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Let's just get uh, a few more into those uh, details a little further. So you knew to go to look at Rookies and On the Rocks because TJ had told you that that's where they were going? That's where they were going. Yeah, when, when I talked to them at 10, 10 whatever time, mm -hmm. it, that was On the Rocks. Okay. And then when I, at 1230, that was Rookies. All right. How did you know? Is he? How did you know that he was? You know what? I, I, I don't. I. You know what? That is. That's a good question. I don't know if someone told me that. Mm-hmm. After you know the next day when I talked to Jeff, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, if, but I went to rookies, so okay. that's a blank spot that I okay. I really can't answer that. Maybe it could be. Maybe it could be that the day before when he got your truck, yeah, maybe he just, maybe TJ in passing just told you, hey, me and Jeff are going to be going to rookies and on the rocks. Maybe that's a possibility. I think that, that very well could be, but I, I can't remember that, so I have, okay. I'd be lying if I said yes or no. Okay. So, so when you talk, you said you just mentioned on the 19th when, uh, did you talk to Jeff? Once again, Jeff was... Uh, TJ's friend, they met up that night, um, and we'll get into all the when you found out the story. Um, on the 19th, did you talk to Jeff? I think it was the 20th. All right, so, that all right, so I then, ended up talking to Jeff once we got the phone. Okay. All right, so you did not talk to Jeff on the 19th. In return, Jeff did not call you on the 19th. No. All right, so he never called you to tell you what had happened allegedly the night before, All right, which we're, we'll get into those details in a minute. But at the time you're looking for, you're trying to find your truck, you find your truck, and on the 19th, at no time on the 19th did you know this story regarding Amanda and allegedly what happened at Rookies. You had no idea regarding no. Any, any of that. If, if I got the phone the 19th, then I'm going to say yes. Okay. If I got the phone on the 20th, then I'm saying no. No. Okay. I, I, so I'm saying it was the 20th is when I got the phone, mm-hmm. and when when we talked to Jeff, you go mm-hmm. here, I'll go here, and that's when I find out about he slapped her like mm-hmm. Amanda. All right, and we'll get and we'll get into that. So, thank you, thank you for for that. Okay, yeah. so when you went to get your truck that day, it's just sitting there all by itself in the parking lot. Uh, anything unusual about it? Anything at all? No. Nope. No, his uh, equipment, all his, you know, shin guards, mm. umpiring mask, clothes, all that was in my back seat. And that mm-hmm. nothing was wrong with my truck at all. Okay. Um, can I, I, I suppose you're thinking you're a little pissed? You know, he was supposed to bring the truck back. I mean, we were kind of... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah, little bit. I, okay. I mean, I'm concerned, but... My truck was okay, so I was thinking, okay, he got hammered. He listened to what I said. Don't drive my damn truck right. if you're drunk. And when I – he was under the influence of something that night, whether it was alcohol only, alcohol mm-hmm. something else or something else. He was uh, – he didn't drive my truck. So that mm-hmm. was a relief, but um, mm-hmm. I figured he was with Jeff or shacked up with somebody and, you know mm-hmm. – He'd find his car, and okay. uh, and we'd talk from then. Okay, but once again, I'm guessing you also were a little worried though that he wasn't. You know, you're calling oh, him, yeah, you're messing, and he's not responding to you. Probably that worried maybe at least a little bit. Oh, well, I was worried a lot. In the right. back of my mind, I was like, that ain't like him. Usually, he touches base. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like when he would drive to Stephen F. When he'd leave on a, like Sunday night. Let me know when you get there. He'd call, hey, I just got here. Okay, thank you, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, a lot of kids don't do that. But, you yeah. know, he he would let you know, hey, I'm here, I'm there. I'm, you know, when, especially if he was using my my vehicle. Yeah. Or our vehicle. So, okay. So. All right, so uh, let's ju- – I'm going to just – for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to – we're just going to take for granted that you did not get this call about the phone until the 20th. So you go through the 19th, okay. you're not, um, you know, you're not talking, of course, to TJ, uh, you've not talked to Jeff, he's not called you to tell you anything that went on the night before, anything like that. You get to the 20th, and then this person who uh, found TJ's phone calls you. Why don't you talk a little bit about that right now, uh, Tom? You get this call, it, it's TJ's number, maybe, maybe the person called you from actually using TJ's phone, and once once you once again go over that, what does this person say who found TJ's phone and phone and where? It was it was a relief that I'm getting a phone call from TJ. I was mm-hmm. like, finally. And then it was, hey, I found this phone, da 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 da. From I work over here. It was right down from the 19th hole, so it was on the road heading north past mm-hmm. the 19th hole. It, I think it's called Rotor Rooter. 
Okay. And uh, it, a guy was out on his smoke break that next day and found the phone laying in the grass. Wow. And it was, oh, I, I can't remember what kind of phone he had. If he had a flip phone, I can't remember mm -hmm. what he had. But it was like someone slung it out of, you know, the way this person told me. It looked like someone just slung it out a window or something. And uh, mm -hmm. anyway, that person took that phone and went and charged it. Wow. And once it got charged, that's when he found out I was the last phone call from TJ or, or vice versa mm -hmm. from me. Yeah. And that's when they called. Wow. And so it was a, uh, I'm going to say that person was in his 20s. I mean, I, I brought my pistol because I didn't mm -hmm. know what the hell sure. was going down. Of course. And and so I went to this apartment complex in the middle of the night. And anyway, the guy said, hey, man, I'm sorry. I said, look, the police are going to know. So and mm -hmm. I can't remember what the guy's young man's name was. Mm -hmm. But he worked there. The police got in contact with him and after the fact. And, you know, his story all panned out and all that. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's when I that's when real, real serious. I like something's were going down here. Okay. And so, all right. I'm so, assuming, please. That's where I got Jeff's number. Was mm -hmm. from TJ's phone. All right. And I didn't have Jeff's phone number. Okay. So, so and I, I and I certainly want to talk to you about that. But just for the purposes of this young man who found the phone, to your knowledge, the police have talked to him and they have ruled him out as having anything to do with TJ's disappearance. To your knowledge. Oh yeah. Yes, to my knowledge, yes. Okay. So after this phone, I uh, getting the phone back, I'm guessing you talked to the police, you filled the mystery person's report, and then they were the ones who told you, well, he's off, you know, he's a young man. They kind of, in a way, blow you off, kind of. This was like the third or fourth time I called. Finally, they said, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we, we, we are going to. You know, because I knew, I knew several of the people in law enforcement just because I coached and taught their kids and and I had this one parent um that was a finally he ended up taking the case he was a detective mm -hmm. um said Tom we're going to get to the bottom of this mm -hmm. and that's when it became a missing person and they you know were putting out flyers everywhere and then um yeah. oh god my mind is shot right. um what's the Equisearch. Equisearch, yeah. Contacted, yeah, contacted mm -hmm. me and asked if they could get involved. I said, hell yes. Mm -hmm. You know, let's do this. So then we had hundreds and hundreds of people. Like I said, I've, I've been in that community and taught a lot of kids and parents, and they, you know, there was, it was overwhelming how many people and how many searches went on all through that whole area. Okay. So, uh, All right, and how and, and the way you remember it, once again, I realize it's been over nine years. How um how soon after? Let's just put it this way. How soon after the phone was found did those first searches take place? I was searching myself and a couple of my mm -hmm. friends, and uh, we were just combing the area where the phone was found. Went over to the, where the ballpark was, walked around there, went down to the the creek and looked around there. And then I'm going to say about a week, four days mm -hmm. after that, that EquiSearch and we did a underneath I-45, that's the interstate right there in Spring by Spring Creek. That's where we did our first camp of, uh, they got together and there's probably 50 people out searching. Wow. And then that following Saturday, I don't know how many days apart that was, we met at Wood Forest Stadium, and that's where the camp was, and that's when hundreds and hundreds of people. And so we searched all over, down by my old house in Amanda's, down there by the San Jacinto River. Went, you know, people went to the National Forest, I mean, all over. Sam Houston, I mean... Course. Everywhere. So if I could just say, though, just narrowing this down, once again, if you can remember this, from where you believe the phone was found, of course, you were not there when it was found. You just have the description from this guy who found it. How many blocks in each direction would you say that they searched from where the phone was found? 
Would you say it was a mile in any direction, two miles in any direction? What would you say specifically regarding the phone? Do you know? From the, from where that phone was found? Oh, gosh. I would, hell, up to 15 miles. All right, well, I guess what I'm saying is, like people walking, I, I realize that, uh, you know, a, a, a foot search in any direction from where the phone was found. I guess that's what I'm saying. Right. Well, what, what, yeah, what we, people would go to, like, okay, they had a map. Okay, you, you mm -hmm. group of 20 go to this section. And they would drive and and walk mm -hmm. that area. Okay. You people go here. You people go there. You know what I mean? So it wasn't yeah. just per se walking. But I did all the walking from where that phone was, mm -hmm. and there's some uh, apartment complexes further north on that same road, and there was a lot of, uh, there's one apartment complex that there was some shady uh, activity went on in that apartment complex from drugs to uh, mm -hmm. illegals to you know, and that, see, that was a, a, a thing that they brought to my attention that, you know, it could have, he could have been kidnapped and taken, yeah. you know, but that's just them throwing that out. Yeah, I believe a, differently. Just, but, just to theorize. Just a theory. Yeah, there, right. yeah, right. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm also asking you is that, so they're they're looking for TJ and... Uh, how would you describe this? Or you already mentioned some apartment complexes. You mentioned a creek. Are there any, and I'm going to be doing a map. The listeners should know they should be looking for a map on YouTube right now of the, all this area. But the way you would describe it, um, a lot of woods in the area, a lot of places. Let's just say that something did happen to TJ. Is there like underbrush or something where a human body could be hidden? What, how would you describe the area around where the phone was found, that, that general area? That general area where the phone was found it were businesses, restaurants, um, and there were some secluded wooded areas around that. But if you go a mile, mile and a half away, you got Spring Creek, which is heavily wooded. You got mm -hmm. uh, where he where he umpired um, back in there. That goes down to the creek. That's heavily wooded out there. Then it becomes a subdivision. You know, when you go through the ditch. So mm -hmm. there were spots of heavily, but right where the phone was found, there were only little bits and pieces of wooded areas that I walked and searched through. <laughs> you find a couple homeless people, wow. you know, that had, had you know, shacks, like, put in there. You know, they weren't there, but you can see where people were, were sleeping and, and, and living there. But that's, that's about it. you know. That's about it. Then you had the interstate. The interstate was maybe a quarter mile from mm -hmm. where the phone was found. So, yeah. you know, the, the access to getting on the interstate was quick. Okay. You know, it was probably a block and a half, and then you got you got the interstate. Okay. So. All right. So, so the police are involved. Extra search is involved. You're doing these searches. Probably one of the more complete searches, very quick that I've heard. Of regarding unfound and um which is great you had a lot of people involved going to different areas and we as the listeners know we've had some people who have tried to organize searches and only a few people show up but in this case it sounds like you had a nice showing people looking different areas not just around the phone but even going back to where uh, tj was going to school uh et cetera, to see if anybody saw him of course uh, none of these searches um uh, of course, found anything. The only, in fact, the only thing that popped up of TJ's after his the disappearance was the phone. But I think the main point that we want to move on to now, because I think that the listeners are probably uh, it's burning in their mind right now, since you got the phone and you knew TJ was then missing, I'm sure you talked to Jeff. What did he say? And is this when you found out about what we just I've referred to at this point, the story? What did Jeff have to right. say? What I recall was he said they were there at at Rookies, and TJ was messed up, and he was over there with, and he smacked her. I said, he did what? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that was out of character to me, but I'm not around what he's in that shape. Mm-hmm. But um, he said, and I went to the bathroom, and when I come out, TJ was gone, and they said they escorted him out and called a taxi. And that's, he said, so I, I assume he got in a taxi. And that was the end of that. But then it was... All right, so... Know, I, I, all right, and the listeners should know that I got to speak to Jeff, and I will relay my conversation with him after this interview. But at the time, was did Jeff say he actually saw the slap, uh, TJ slapping Amanda? Did he actually see that, or is, did Jeff explain to you that that was something he was told happened? The way, once again, the way well, you remember it. Right. I, it's all the same to me. I can't remember. He said, yeah, I saw TJ hit her, or, mm-hmm. but he said TJ slapped her. That's what he did tell me, TJ slapped her. But he, I don't think he ever said, I saw TJ do it, or that's mm-hmm. what Amanda told me. You know, mm-hmm. that's just what I recall out of that. Okay. And when you finally did talk to Jeff, did he realize that TJ was missing? I after her, yeah, I said, hey, I found his phone, this person had it, and he's like, oh, I, and that's how that all went. It, it, I didn't know. And okay. I'm like, well, when I, you were with him, why don't, why don't you know? But I understood. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's like, okay, well, we got the police involved, and, I mean, Jeff was there. You know, he, I know he gave his statement to the police that night or that day mm-hmm. when they questioned him and mm-hmm. and me and we'll be able to fill all that out. Okay. So All right. So let me just ask once again, I, I the listeners I will tell the listeners what Jeff told me after this interview, but I just want to keep it clear on your discussion with Jeff. Did Jeff ever say when you talked to him, did he ever say when he came out of the restroom, TJ's not there? Did Jeff ever say well, you know what? I went out to look for him. He wasn't there. They said he got kicked out, and I went out to look for him. Did Jeff ever tell you that? Once again, as best as you can remember back at the time. Yeah, I don't. I don't recall that. All. I, all I do remember was Jeff said they escorted him out. You know, asked him to leave. They they called a taxi. Mm-hmm. And that, and then he was gone. So I don't know if Jeff went out. I, I, I couldn't. I'd, I'd uh, okay. be lying if I told you. All right. He so he out. did not. So Jeff didn't say. I got out of the restroom. He wasn't there. TJ was wasn't there. Uh, I asked some people. Hey, where TJ go? This is just an example. And somebody said, Yeah, he slapped this woman over there. And then you know they kicked him out while you were in the restroom. And Jeff said, I went outside to look for TJ and he wasn't there. That the way you remember it, that didn't come out of his mouth back in 2011. No. Okay. All right. Once again, I realize it's been over nine years, but I just want to make sure because I think right. it's very important for us to understand, you know, everybody's actions and behaviors and what they said that night. You know, being that, right. of course, TJ, you know, goes out of this uh, rookie's bar and, and he's just gone. You know, you got to ask his friend, Jeff, who he's known for several years, you know, what do you remember? You know, and. Yeah, you would think. Okay. So. <laughs> Jeff says yeah, would say. so Jeff um claims that he didn't see T J after he came out of the bar. He was told this story, did not go outside uh to look for T J and of course the time about the time that Jeff is coming out of the restroom is about the time that T J would have been calling you around twelve thirty seven and saying, I love you, Daddy. About the same Correct. time. About the same time. Correct. Okay. So we have Jeff's um story. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he says he was in the in the restroom at the time, and I got to speak to Amanda as well. And once again, I'll go into the details later, but she did verify that. Just so the listeners know, that that's what I can reveal. Amanda did verify that, that Jeff was not there when this happened, but I will go into the details later. All right, so we have Jeff. Did Jeff uh, help out with any, any of the searches? Did you ever see him in person um, after TJ disappeared? Did you two meet up? Uh, talk over anything? You know, he, Please. He, he, he was at one of the searches. I can't remember if it was the first one or the second one. Um, but, you know, he was living where, where he was living. I don't even know where he was living at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was married. So, you know, that 
Mm-hmm. So, like I said, he wasn't around. Around, I did not keep in con- contact. Maybe two or three times during mm-hmm. the the whole process. I recall him contacting me maybe six months later or whatever, um, that, asking, "Hey, any news?" You know, and then that was it. That was the last of the times we talked. Okay. So, all right, so you at least got to see him once uh, afterwards. And are you then saying he was married at the – I can't remember I'm talking to him whether I I noticed this in the timeline or not. Are you saying that Jeff uh, was married at the time of TJ's disappearance or he got married shortly after that? I can't remember. I, I, I think he was married. Okay. I, I think he was married. Um, okay. I know because when we went to – yeah, I'm pretty sure he was married. Okay. All right. That's fine. And I don't I'm not saying that has anything to do with the disappearance. It's just when I talk right. to him I can't remember if he said he got married after or before. But okay, so right. if one one way or the other, either way, he's out with uh T J and, and that's fine. Um did the police or yourself, when you found out about this story, um did you has anybody ever spoken to the manager of rookies that night? The owners of rookies that night. Do you know if any of that was done any time since 2011? I went in. The manager wasn't there. That was on duty, and that was what it all. The police don't get involved. Mm, okay. You know what I mean. So yeah. don't you count. You know, get these people going. We will do all that. And I know Jeff went in. The next day or the day after, because we went our different ways. I went to 19th Hole. I went to On the Rocks. We went, uh, I think he called Amanda's place of business and mm-hmm. talked to the mother, supposedly. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's how that all got left. And I never went back in. I haven't been back in rookie since. Uh, and I can understand so, that. Okay. So I guess what I'm asking is the police. You believe, no proof of this, but you'd hope that they did go in and talk to the, the manager, the owner, uh, about that night. But you don't have any personal yes. knowledge of that. No, I don't. That's just what I was told. Okay. All right. Now, you'll remember, well, the listeners should remember, Jeff, he claims that when he came out of the restroom, he was told by somebody – that TJ got kicked out and that they called it ca- taxi for him. Has the this taxi company or taxi driver in the last nine years ever been tracked down to verify that he got called or, or anything else? Do we know that really happened? Any proof of that? No. No, we don't. That, that's just what was told. So there was – from what I'm hearing mm-hmm. that – they said it when they called a taxi, but no, because from what the police told me, they called every taxi agency in the area from Yellow Cab to all the other ones, mm-hmm. and there was no record of anybody going to Rookies that night. But there are independent mm-hmm. um, people, you know, that kind of like before mm-hmm. Uber came, you know, yeah. that would do that stuff. Right. So, right. That, and no, nobody has any proof that that ever existed. Okay, um, and right, these are the this is the years before Uber and, and Lyft existed, um, and it very well may be that a taxi driver did show up, but TJ wasn't there, and so Correct. you know that you know, could be um, that could be a possibility. Now, regarding the 19th hole, being that, that you'd said that the phone was found on the same street at the 19th hole, did. That they go up there and to see if maybe TJ, when he left rookies, went back to the 19th hole because it's not that far. Uh, do you know if the police looked no. into that? I, I, that I have no idea. Okay. I, I told when I when I was talking to the police early on, they wouldn't give me any information whatsoever because they didn't, in their words, they didn't want to hinder. I don't know if hinder is the right word, but uh, compromise their case. Yeah. So, you right. know, and I gave my two cents who I thought mm-hmm. who was involved. Yeah. And I gave that's, – that's what I said. And until today, I still believe that those people 
are involved in this. They know what the hell went down. Okay. All right. We, we but, once again for these uh, interviews, we try to wait, stay away from theorizing and speculation things. But right, uh, I think right. I think the listeners already at this point in doing this interview believe that you believe foul play was involved by somebody. I don't think that that's a secret. Yes. All right, but we're not going to get too deep into the theories. Now, the next thing was something that uh, came upon uh, came up um, very early on, and I think our conversations, Tom, was that your truck keys. I had asked you, being that TJ disappeared and he was driving your truck, I had asked you, so after he disappeared, you only had one set of keys for your truck. You had that extra set that you used to go over and switch vehicles and bring your truck back. But you told me that some point after that, you did have both sets of keys. So somehow the set of keys that TJ had on the 90 disappeared got back to you. Do you know how, do you even remember how that happened? Well, I didn't until the other day when I talked to the cold case detective, and he informed me that Jeff gave me my keys. So that was the day I guess I met Jeff, whether it was the 19th that evening Mm -hmm. or the 20th. That's when I got my my set of keys back. Um, I even asked Jeff a couple weeks ago when I was on the phone with him. He said, I don't know. I, Mm -hmm. I have no clue how how you got your keys. Right. But the detective told me that, that Jeff gave me the keys. I didn't remember that. I didn't know if they were just, mm-hmm. TJ put them in the, you know, under my floor mat or in my gas tank or on a tire. Yeah. I have no, I, I have no clue. I just knew I had my other set, so it wasn't a big deal. Mm-hmm. But, all right, and that's uh, – and uh, being that you said you talked to Jeff about it, I also talked to Jeff about it, and I will tell the listeners what he, you, Tom, already – the listeners should know Tom already knows what Jeff said about it, but I will relay that conversation uh, after this interview. And once again, I also had an interview with Amanda that I will pass along uh, as well. All right, so you, somehow you did get these keys back. You had both sets, even though TJ had your set, so it seems maybe – that somehow Jeff had the keys. Maybe TJ gave them to him. You know, being that you know maybe they were afraid of drinking and driving, TJ could have given those keys to Jeff. Correct? It's a possibility. Correct. Yeah. All right. And, or he just left them in his car somewhere. Right, and it, that would have been the responsible thing to do. So there's probably there's nothing you know suspicious regarding that. Let's move on to this. Um, the fact is, and this is something that I just discovered recently. Maybe you did too. Uh, there is video of rookies both inside and outside of that night, right? Correct. Uh, I know you haven't seen the video though, correct? No, I have not. All right. They would not show me the video. All right, but you've um, there is an interview that the 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 cold case investigator who was working on um, TJ's disappearance as of the beginning of 2021. This episode came. Uh, we're doing this interview on December 27th, 2020. This interview will come out on January 1st, 2020. But an interview that he did in 2020, um, uh, Tom, I'm thinking you maybe had a a chance to watch that. I sent you the link. He says in the video on YouTube that there is video of uh, TJ outside of Rookies. What does it show? It shows him on the phone, which happened to be me. Mm -hmm. And... After at twelve thirty seven when we got disconnected, T J walked out of the out of the wherever their cameras were, walked out of the view of the camera and was never seen again. Okay. And most importantly in that interview, what direction does the, the, the detective say he that T J is going? You know, I forget, but okay. I'm assuming uh, he had to be going north. But he wasn't. That's and that's the big part. He was the going listeners, south. the listeners need to understand this. And once again, I, I'm hoping that the listeners, before they uh, listen to the episode, I will have posted the link to this interview that this detective did. I also got to talk to the detective regarding this, and he wanted people to view it. So that's why I'm going to point people to it. This interview that he did in the video it shows TJ going south from rookies. Whereas his phone was found north, north of rookies, correct. And they do some speculation in that interview, the cold case detective with the uh, reporter slash interviewer. So there is a video. Um, we don't know what the inside shows, but we certainly know what the outside shows, and it shows T.J. walking away by himself. At least that's 
what the cops say. Correct. Correct. All right. So, but you have not seen it. Yes, sir. Nobody else in your family has I have seen not. it. Nobody else in your family. No, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. Okay. I, I would have to say no. They have not. Okay. Let's move on to this, and everybody knows how we like to be very detailed and unfound. We've already talked about the last phone call that TJ's phone made because this guy said, yeah, I just charged up, and your call was last. Do we know anything about any text messages after TJ talked to you? In addition, do you know if the police ever pinged his phone? Do you know any of that information at all? I All I know is the last the – last thing on his phone was me at 12:37. So I don't want to assume here but to me that means there was no text message after I, that was the last time his phone was used was right mm-hmm. when I uh, when he called you. Done talking to him. Okay. Yeah, at but, 12:37. All right, but we don't know uh specifically very technically about any text messages. Is it possible that he no. could to texting and you don't know anything about the pinging either it, it, it at all no not at all. all right. i know they did on these other people mm-hmm. they pinged their i know they pinged their phones mm-hmm. that's what they told me that they're trying to see the phone calls and all that but i never heard any results from any of that okay now, as we talked about earlier in this conversation, of course, you are not the only person in the family, of course, uh, your wife at least at the time, Janelle, and you have uh, three sons. One was very young at 10 years old, but you have two other sons, James and Will, who you know, just two and four years younger than uh, TJ at the time. Now, at what time, what, at what moment did your son James, who would have been second in line, tell you about a call – that he got uh, seemingly the night that TJ disappeared. When did you find out about this, and what did your son James tell say happened? Well, what what James said was this person. I'm not going to give his name. Okay. Uh, called called James's phone and said, "You better get over here. TJ's fixing to get his ass kicked." Um, but in retrospect, it ended up being that James didn't get called. It was his buddy, Jake, that got called Mm. and James and Jake were on the rocks, but they weren't together, but they were, you know what I mean? They got there, but Mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole blurry thing to me on what went down. But what James told me ended up being completely wrong nine years ago and Hmm. when the detective met with him what james said nine years ago he said again when he got interviewed by the cold case and they said that was a complete lie so Hmm. here we find out it was jake that got the phone call and jake went over there james was getting food he was seen walking out on video with a girl with food to go. Mm-hmm. So it sounded like James didn't even know what was going on until later. Wow. So that's that's all I know from there. All right, so maybe uh, I'll try, try to put this in, a, in another way. For nine years, James claimed that he got a phone call about from a person, and we know what that person's name. You don't want to mention him. I totally, I, I'm totally fine with it. Um, right. This person who must have been in Rookies to see what happened uh, or heard Correct. about it or something uh, said, you know, TJ's, uh, you know, looking to get his ass kicked. And for nine years, James claimed that he got that phone call and that he actually went down to Rookies. That's what it, That was his story for nine years. Correct. But then recently, this I told case detective that, that once again, the one that's on the YouTube video, the one that I got to talk to, he's been able to verify that James's story that he told for the last nine years, um, I, you know, you said, well, I, I don't know if it's a lie or not. He just, it, the way he remembers it is not what the facts say. I'm not saying he was intent, we're not saying he was intentionally lying. I want, I want to make for the record. I'm not saying he was trying right. to mislead anybody, but... Um, what he says he did that night was not 
true according to video evidence and other things? Yes, sir. You are correct. Okay. So instead, what this detective – and I, I just want to give a shout-out to this uh, detective risk because – uh, Montgomery County, because we know so many times, you know, disappearances that are nine years old don't get any attention at all. Zero. Not just in Texas, in Florida, Pennsylvania, California, everywhere. And it's good right. that he's working on it. In fact, you called him and you got him right on the phone very quickly. So I, I want to give him uh, a lot of credit for that. And then he called me also. I'd like to thank him for calling me as well. So he's working on this in, in 2020 and he figured out. That it was not James who went down to rookies. It was this other guy, Jake, who got the call who went down there. Correct. Okay. And do you know if Jake – do you know what know happened? I don't know if Jake showed up or not. Okay. I have no clue. Okay. And so uh, have you ever talked to Jake at all about any of this? Yeah, but they yeah, – that, you know, first week or whatever, but he was so hot on drugs like my mm. son – that you know, it was like, hell, who, who knows? Who knows what okay. was what? A bit. Uh, as far as Jake goes, um, unfortunately, because of what he was doing at the time, we're not saying he's still doing that in 2020, but the, the lifestyle he had at the time, um, that's his story, and we're not sure that that's the truth of the story either. Correct. All we know is is that your son James. Uh, would, did not go down to rookies, and in fact, he was nowhere near. Uh, he was with a woman at the time, and he was no near, nowhere near rookies at the time. That's what the police say. And, yes, it's probably a half a mile difference, maybe mm -hmm. a little shorter than that from the two bars. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for when he was going home, he, he would definitely have to go buy rookies. Okay. And so he wasn't driving, so... Mm -hmm. He would have had uh, gone by there. Okay. So. Now, now though, we should be honest though uh, in talking in in talk in bre you know uh, breaching broaching this topic uh, regarding James. You've told me that the police have really grilled James regarding this. Yeah, the the, the cold case detective mm. pretty much told him he was a old faced liar, and well. and James was. Well, Am I telling a different story now than I did? And he said, no, it's, you're mm. telling the exact same thing. He said, but what, that story is a lie. Wow. We got video of you coming out of On the Rocks carrying a to-go deal of food, which, and he was with that girl. And that, I, don't, I can't remember what that girl's name was, but mm -hmm. um, she denied ever being there, too. And because she got questioned. And uh, so we got video evidence, and well, I was on drugs too, and you know, mm. it's so. Yeah, drugs don't help your memory. That's for sure. No, that's no. That, you know that we run into that a lot, uh, covering almost 200 disappearances. We talk a lot about people with. Uh, addictions is missing people. We have talked about people with addictions who are suspects or witnesses, and it's it can get very speculative as to whether what they're remembering is true or not. Very common, but uh, but this uh, police officer, Detective Risk, has talked to your your son James, and uh, you know really grilled him. But uh, I just want to be clear for the record: there's no belief out there that James had anything to do with TJ's disappearance. That's the most important. Part. No. All right. Right. No. None whatsoever. Okay. And in fact, as you stated, James and TJ uh, were close brothers. You know. Of course. Yes. So of course, sometimes brothers aren't so close. I have two brothers that I'm very close right. to, but you sometimes brothers right. are enemies. Okay. And this is not the situation. All right. All right. All right. So we we have to. So I guess through all of this, what we're saying is, if we're to believe this call happened, somebody at rookies saw something happened. And that person was really worried about TJ, you know, and he worried this person who was making this call was worried something bad could happen to TJ. Yes. Right. And, and lo and behold, TJ goes missing and his phone is found later, you know, after, you know, after this. And there was video, of course, of TJ being outside. So him getting kicked out or leaving did happen. So something was going on there uh, it, that it worried at least one person enough to pick up a phone and call Jake, why the person called Jake? Do you think it's possible? Be, 
that they didn't have James's number, didn't have your phone number? Is that? Oh, I know they. I know they didn't have mine, and I don't even know if James. I think mm. you know he he loses. I have no idea why they mm. called Jake, but, mm. and not and not James. Okay. So. All right. So okay. So we have somebody calling somebody uh, because of what happened, and this goes back to this incident of TJ slapping uh, this young woman we are calling Amanda. That is not her real name. Um, and then things, you know, TJ getting kicked out, which, you know, I don't think that's that unusual. I think that if, you know, a man hits a woman in a bar, that I think a lot of men are going to get kicked out of that bar. So, that, you know, and in fact, it's, it's uh, you know, had TJ not disappeared, I think it's possible that Amanda might have filed charges against him. Maybe. 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 Right. But we have to talk about this, and as I've already stated, uh, there's probably uh, a thread running through all of this between the lines that you do think something of foul play nature happened to TJ. And so let's go a little bit in this direction because at the time, uh, this is factual information, uh, there uh, are two brothers. Their names are Nathan and, Bri and Brian Bell. And at least one of them was involved in a very uh, serious crime uh, back in uh, 2011. Um, their names have popped up. Do you remember uh, the reason that they popped up? How soon after TJ disappeared? Do you remember how that transpired? Well, from what I recall, it was before TJ disappeared that that incident went down of uh, blowing up a vehicle. Right. That's and right. And there was a Kirk, the two the Bell brothers and Chris. Gain uh, were was the other one involved, mm -hmm. and they uh, I don't know if it was Nathan and Chris were in the uh, armed services together, or if it was all three of them were in, but they were a tight pack, and that's and then just word of mouth from people in the community mm -hmm. of. You know, it's called Rumor Ridge. Oak Ridge used to be called Rumor Ridge. Huh. That all these, all these rumors were going about this person did this, this yeah. is this, and you know, Jeff. Jeff told me, I don't know if I'm going off script, but Jeff told me when we talked that when he talked to Amanda's mother, mm -hmm. that she said, "Well, if TJ slapped." Amanda, then he's a dead man. It was now, something like that. You just Jeff told me about that, and I will detail it in. De I will talk about that in detail. I also talked to the, to Amanda about that, uh, and those conversations I will detail afterwards. But um, but yes, Jeff did tell me that story, and I will let everybody know how he happened to talk to Amanda's mother. But regarding uh, just strictly sticking to uh, the bells. Um, do you remember the who was the person who brought their name up? Do you remember? Oh God! It, it might have been James and his girlfriend, and okay. you know, just that whole group mm -hmm. of people that used to hang out. Their names, because I there's went two people, you know. Hey, what the, what do you know? What do you know? And mm -hmm. that's what people were saying. All right. You'll never find out, you know, stuff like that. But that's third hand knowledge. That ain't no. that wasn't said to me. It very and and we also have to keep in mind in something. The reason that their names might have even come up in the first place is because everybody knew about these charges that, of what they had done earlier that year. That that the charges were still pending. <laughs> That that also Correct. being that, um, and and I will be linking to those articles that it wasn't both Bell brothers; it was just one of the Bell brothers, but with four other right. guys. Um, it sounds like they were trying to get a, a revenge on a, a drug deal gone bad. I'm not saying they were trying to kill anybody. I'm, I would not say that, but they were trying to scare somebody by blowing up a car. And there was no, there, it wasn't Correct. a plan where somebody was going to get in it, turn the key, and it was going to blow up, killing the person. They were just going to go over to this person's house and just torch this car. All right, so it was destruction of property, 
not actually trying to kill somebody. They got caught doing that. And at the time of TJ's disappearance, uh, those charges were still pending. And in fact, a month later, uh, they were charged with these crimes. In the end, they I don't know if they spent any time in jail, but they had to pay some very, very hefty fines, actually over $100,000. But this, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, that could have been on James's mind and others, you know, if they were trying to figure out if something hurt TJ, these guys' names popped up. Right. So, because, and I would assume because of Amanda being involved and right. Nathan and Amanda. That's right. Uh, you, you know, that's, that's how that probably all did come. That's right. To and, there. and there and and man, in talking to Amanda, she did admit that she was dating one of the Bell brothers at the time of TJ's disappearance. All right? She admitted that. I think everybody in, locally knows that. I don't think that that's news uh, locally in the Spring, Texas area, but um, we're still keeping her real name out of this. And um, But she did admit that, that she was with the Bells last night. She gives them an alibi uh, for that night uh, She that, that after she was – Hit and she admitted that she described and I'll once again go through that with uh, the listeners in detail that um, that there's no way that the Bells could have done anything to TJ because she was with both of them that night and said that she saw them and brought them home or they took her home well after uh, TJ disappeared. In fact, I think they were seen at another bar even after TJ disappeared. Okay. Um. Have you have you or um have you ever spoken to Amanda? Have any has anybody in your family ever spoken to anybody in her family to try to get more details about what what happened that night? I was told to stay away from her. Okay. Do not have any conversations. I think I told you my she drove by and and I think James flipped her off. Oh. Or whatever, and then next thing you know, the police are calling saying your son's harassing mm-hmm. her. You know. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So that that's pretty much. I never had another conversation with her. Okay. So you Actually, just I, I just never really had conversations with her. Okay. So you're just fall, you're just doing what the police have told you to do. Correct. Stay away, and that's probably a good choice. All right. All right, so the connection, I guess what we're saying, the connection, the reason the Bell names might have come up is a combination of their reputation, at least at the time in 2011, combined with the fact that one of them was dating Amanda at the time of TJ's disappearance. I think it's a combination of things that um, might have gotten this rumor started. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. Okay, so um, have any witnesses – um, of course, people who just happened to be at Rookies that night have nothing to do with Amanda, nothing to do with the Bell Brothers, nothing to do with the person who called, says, hey, TJ's going to get his ass kicked, etc. Just people there on their own. Has anybody ever come forward to police, to you, being that you're kind of known in the community as a, a teacher and coach, anybody come forward independently to say what they saw happen that night that TJ disappeared? Not one person that I'm aware of. Huh. Has come to me, I, you know, like that, and I keep stating this: the police would not tell me anything. For I don't know if that was for my own safety, or you know, mm-hmm. I, because I, I'm telling you, back then I was ready to. Who cares if I go to jail? Yeah, I'm getting even. Right. But that that my I guess my common sense took over and said, look, you still got three other boys to take care of. You know, yeah. you're not going to solve anything by – so I didn't, and I let them do their their job, which I know they got a hard job, but mm-hmm. it just – Okay. I don't know how people – how no one has come forward mm-hmm. that was there that night. Someone had to see something, mm-hmm. and if they're afraid, I don't know. I don't understand. Okay. Likewise, uh, being that at least the video shows TJ, if we're to believe the police, you've not seen the video, I've not seen the video, but if we're to believe uh, the detective, he says that TJ was by himself leaving uh, rookies walking south. Uh, Has anybody, to your knowledge, ever come forward and say, yeah, I saw TJ walking that night? No. 
No. Not no. at all. But somehow, and they talk about this in this interview that Detective Risk did on YouTube, um, they did theorize, this is not us theorizing, but just telling people about the video, that maybe somebody picked TJ up as he was walking south and then you know drove him north, and that's how the phone got there. But nobody's ever come forward to say anything about that. No news about TJ being picked up, being seen, nothing at all. Nothing. Nothing, nothing at all. Uh, any Even any sightings of him, people who said, well, I might have seen him here, might have seen him there, anything like that? Not after 1237, no. Not after. Okay, all right. So he has this, um, you know, I, I realize that, you know, I think uh, – People are going to automatically think, does this slapping of this woman have something to do with TJ's disappearance, or is it just a coincidence? I think that's where a lot of um, people's minds are going to go, um, and I did talk to uh, Amanda about that, and she did tell me what the last nine years have been like regarding this, and I will pass that along. But for you, um, Tom, um, what have the last nine years – uh, been like, of course, you've already talked about in this interview. You actually lost another son um, to an accident six months after this. Uh, I can't imagine. I, I don't have any children. The listeners know I don't have any children, but that uh, I, I just can't imagine any of that. Not just one, you know, just both, but just even one of these um, horrible things happening. I mean, how have you how have you made it through the last it's, nine years? It's it's been uh, pure hell. It's uh, it's on your mind. Sorry, I'm fixing to lose it here. That's all right. It's it's uh, on, it never leaves your mind. You know, you 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 try to do things to not say forget, but you try to remember the good times and some of the bad times. But that no, it sucks. It's it's mm -hmm. not fair to my other two boys because. And they they grieve also. Same with my ex-wife. Um, it's not fair to them. At least if we can find him, we can put the final chapter, you know, mm -hmm. back. Yeah. And uh, it's I haven't. So it's been nine years. I haven't been to my son's grave since I put him in the ground because I feel I mm -hmm. feel that I'm not doing that for TJ. So, mm -hmm. um, no, it just sucks. Life sucks. It's and, and when you're talking you know, about a grave, kind of glad up to the last chapter of it. And when you're talking about a grave, you're talking about Will's grave, of him uh, dying uh, during this boating. I guess what I would call a boating accident. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. but you know, life life goes on, but I just solve it. I mean, yeah. ideally, that one percent, I would love to see him walk. Yeah. Walk in here one day that hey, yeah. you know, he got free or or whatever. But at least give us a, some final closure and give us his body, so we can put him with his brother and his grandparents and 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 uh, move yeah. on. You know, regarding TJ, Tom, um, was it, it, just ask you this: being that he did go like to go out, went out, went to bars and things, uh, did he ever have a reputation of just walking off by himself? Uh, you know, going. You, of course, you, you know your family's into hunting. You've talked about, et cetera. Did he ever have a reputation of maybe when he got frustrated or got sad or depressed? ever going off on his own, anything like that in his behavior in 23 years? Not, I mean, you know, he'd go run, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, he liked to exercise, so he would, mm -hmm. he'd love to play that disc golf, you know, yep, as I he know. got older. That's, that's me that too, was yes. Big, big hobby. Yes, so me too. So he'd go do, do that, and he'd go by himself, or he'd take Sam and uh, do that, and, you know, we had five and a half acres, so he'd build a little course in our back four acres, you know, throwing it and, mm -hmm. and go out there and do that. But not mm -hmm. ever just disappearing, you know. When he was in college, you know, you, but he would talk at least once a week, if not more, when he was mm -hmm. in college. 
Dad, when are you coming down? You know, I was separated at the time and and all mm-hmm. that. And, you know, I said, well, I got Sam, so it's got to yeah. be when I don't have Sam, you know, and all that. But as to answer mm-hmm. your question, no, it, that wasn't like him to just disappear. Just go off for you know, a few hours and blow off some steam or anything. Right. Um, and he wasn't a big bar person. I mean, yeah. I never heard about him like, you know, going, hey, I'm going to this bar or that bar, you know, for 23 years old. Mm-hmm. When I was single, that's what I, you know, I mean, yeah. you got all the buddies and we were we were going bar hopping and trying to find women. Right. Uh, right. But I never heard of... I'm not saying I know everything, but, you know, never heard of him. You know, he'd go to shenanigans and all that up there at Huntsville, but nothing uh, of a, say, every day I'm going here or every day I'm going there. No, that wasn't him. When you heard uh, the story uh, about him slapping uh, Amanda, uh, does that surprise you? That your son would oh, very would it would hit a woman, and you know you've had some chances, you know, to, to think about that. Maybe even talk to James about this. Uh, of course, of course, uh, you know uh, Janelle uh, as well. Um, any insight into your son's behavior regarding that? Because it doesn't seem anybody disputes that. We can dispute what actually happened to him afterwards, but it seems everybody believes he did that. I mean, what can you even say about that? Very surprised. I, I, that's way that's way out of character for him. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, that is way out of character. I when mm-hmm. I heard that, I said, "There's no way." I mean, that was my first thing. There's no way he hit a girl. No way. Mm-hmm. But supposedly, there's evidence that he did slap her. So okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because I don't know what yeah. triggered triggered that. I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Why? No, that has not been told yeah. to me. Why? But like I said, if that happened five minutes before I talked to him, he was incoherent. So, mm-hmm. uh, so what you're saying is it very well could be that the reason that he slapped Amanda is because he just wasn't in his right mind, and it was not the TJ that everybody knew and you know liked and everything. Something had happened to him at that point. I would say that, or I don't. I didn't know my son as well. I thought I knew my son. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's never been an issue that I know of of him ever doing that mm-hmm. to any of his so-called girlfriends. Mm-hmm. You know, right? Because uh, I think I think what we understand about um, men, you know, abusing women, hitting women, uh, now you know, 21st century, it's usually something that is, you know, it's not a one-time thing. You know, if men do that, they usually do it over and over to multiple women. You know, throughout their lives, their life. Right. So it, it, that's what I'm. That's why I'm asking you. It, it doesn't seem to me that your son did that type of thing, and then all of a sudden on this particular night, he slaps. Uh, slaps. It might have even been worse. Maybe he actually hit her closed fist. Um, you know, we just don't know. All I know is that he did something against Amanda that wasn't right, and it does sound like a one-off thing, which is very unusual. All right. Um, do you have um, – uh, Let's. I'm going to ask you this. Uh, you've talked about James, him having some issues, but you've told me uh, at the time, at least in 2011, but you've also told me within the last few years that your son James has uh, gotten his life straightened out. In this, in, yes, he has. Okay. He bought a house. He lives up in New Bronzeville, Texas with his fiance and mm-hmm. – now he lost his job. He got furloughed through all this bull crap pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know it, it, they're they're still still plugging along. So okay. Hopefully after the first of the year he gets a finds another job and continues right. on that way. Right. And so I'm I'm glad to hear that you've mentioned that at the time in 2011 he was having some issues, but he's fought through them, and I'm really uh, happy to hear about that. You know, I hope he he continues on the straight path. And we've also started this conversation talking about your youngest, Sam, who was only 10 at the time. And, um, you know, how has he handled You said that he and uh, TJ were very close. Um, Do you and he talk about TJ once in a while? 
you know, every once in a while, it's uh, you can tell like right around his birthday, and on the 19th, actually, it starts about the 18th and 19th. You can see the mood. Sometimes he wants to talk. Sometimes he doesn't want to talk. You know, I try to express. You gotta. I mean, we got his picture and Will's picture. You know, all over the house. And mm -hmm. I said, you just gotta remember the good times. It's okay to remember a bad time you had with him. You know, but you gotta remember the good times, and that's what you, you try to do on a daily basis. But sometimes it gets overwhelming. And but yeah, you can tell it's affected. It's affecting him still. Yeah. Not as much as he's. You know, you got a girlfriend now. They've been dating for six, eight months, and so that's you can see that's helping them. Like they're in Colorado right now, snow skiing uh, mm -hmm. in Pagosa Springs. So they yeah. have Friday, I think, Christmas Day or the day after. So they'll be there for ten days. So, mm -hmm. but he, uh, yeah, I think that took his. Uh, drive away from college that you yeah. know he's like I ain't, I'm not wasting my time and you know I'm like that's all I must do you need to get that education it's just what you need to do but yeah. you know you are 20 years old make your own decision on on the pit right so okay uh Tom, do you, and once again, we have to mention Janelle. I've had, uh, I want to say again, I've had a chance to talk to Janelle. Uh, we kind of agreed that Tom would do this interview. We don't have many ma male guests on the program. I'm always happy to have them too. But um, do you and she have, is there a website set up or a Facebook page set up for TJ's disappearance that we can direct the listeners to? I do not have any of that. I'm not a, a bad mm -hmm. I, I can't believe I have an iPhone, but <laughs> it's, uh, I feel sure she does have okay. Facebook. I don't know she that does. 100%. Yeah, she has her own I Facebook page. Yeah, no, she does. So I'm just, you, yeah. Please. So uh, you might want to reach out and just send her a, a text and mm -hmm. say, hey, where can I send this? I know there's a, from what I understand, and I've never seen it, there's a TJ missing Facebook or something right. someone told me. Okay. All right, I will so, uh, you know, surely I, I give you permission to put it on there. Okay. You know, you, you're more than welcome to do that. That would because there's a lot of people that I, you know, run into. So yeah, I've, I've been thinking about your son. I saw the the page. Have you? I said no. I've never been on it. Have no desire to get on it. And mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that would probably be good for that to be on there. Okay. Uh, I think there is one. I um, and I will make sure that listeners uh, get to it. I'll make sure that they check it out. And, of course, uh, TJ's disappearance is always also on NamUs and also on um, the Charlie, charlieproject.org. And I also want to give a shout-out once again to Detective Risk, who it seems like he is one of the easier detectives to reach regarding a missing persons case. And so I'd like to give him a shout-out because I know you talked to him within the last couple of weeks. You, you reached him uh, very easily, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we had one even an hour. Okay. That he called me back. That is, it was under an hour, actually. All right. Well, so that, that was, he's, yeah. He uh, he keeps in touch. He's very uh, very. It's nice to have someone that genuinely cares. Yeah. Instead of it being a job, I think it's something that he's you know really pursuing. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would like to thank him also uh, for all the work in Montgomery County Sheriff's for what they're doing mm -hmm. and what they've done, EquiSearch, all that. Yeah. I just want to bring the boy home, and right. uh, that would be awesome if someone could give some information to help us out. And I want to thank you, Ed. That's, well, you're uh, welcome. For what you do. Uh, I sure do appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. It, um, Very much. You, uh, I'm glad that, uh, you know, for example, you hadn't talked to Jeff in a very, very long time, and it seems through a database we were able to reach, I think, his sister – who then contacted him, and he contacted you, and I think it was good that you two ended up talking, you know, after all these years. And now you can find him. Of course, right. I got to talk to him, and the listeners will hear about that in a few minutes. Um, you know, of course, Amanda, using her not a real name, you know, she's still there. Called me back, and then Detective Risk. So we got a lot of uh, good coverage 
for uh, for TJ's disappearance, getting a lot of different points of view, and I think that's always important. That was that was good to do that. So, and I was happy to uh, talk to these people for you. So, well, I appreciate you're, you're very welcome. Uh, Tom, any final words before we complete this interview? Uh, no, sir. I like I want to like sincere thank you for what you're doing, keeping it alive, and. Uh, Without people like you yourself and your people that work for you, this, you know, it would all fade away. And hopefully one day we find my son and yeah. we can put it to, to bed, so, right. to, so to speak. Right. Well, and until that time, Tom, um, um, anything you need, you can give me a call. Of course, that's the way it is with Janelle as well. And, okay. you know, anytime anything pops up. You know, you let me know any questions or somebody contacts you about something. There's a lot of scam artists, et cetera, out there. Anything like that, you call me and we'll talk about it, okay, before any decision okay. has to be made. Uh, and it will always be confidential between us, okay? Okay. I sure do appreciate it, Ed. Tom, uh, thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. And that was my interview with Tom Murray father of T.J. Murray. I thank him for joining me and all of you on the program. I also got to speak to T.J.'s mother, Janelle. Please remember that I produced a YouTube video for T.J.'s disappearance describing the locations that he and Jeff visited that night. You can find it on the Unfound Podcast channel. During the interview, you heard me say that I had the opportunity to speak to three very important people regarding TJ's disappearance. Those people are Jeff Bowden, the friend who was with TJ that night. Amanda, not her real name, who got slapped by TJ at Rookies. And Detective Fadi Rizk, who is the current investigator, although not the original detective, for TJ's disappearance. I will now recount my discussions with all three, going in the order in which I spoke to them. First, Jeff Bowden. I found his sister's number online uh, with a database that we use for Unfound. Uh, Tom called the number. Uh, the sister relayed the message to Jeff, and then he called Tom. Tom told Jeff to call me. He did not. Uh, I waited a few days, maybe three or four days. Uh, he didn't call me. So I ended up calling him on December 20th, 2020. Uh, that was the first conversation I had with him. I also had a conversation with him uh, later in December, uh, maybe December 29th or December 30th. But that first time we spoke for about 20 minutes. And here's what he had to say. Jeff says that he was in the restroom when the slap happened. He admits not going to look for TJ after coming out of the restroom. He says someone told him that a taxi had been called to pick TJ up. He admits that he did not try to call or text TJ that night. Jeff admits he stuck around rookies even after TJ got kicked out. Uh, Amanda, who I spoke to next... Uh, second, uh, verified this, by the way. That's how she remembered it. Jeff said he did not know Amanda at the time and had no interaction with her that night, I guess either before or after this slapping incident. Jeff says that TJ knew Amanda, but Jeff says he did not. Jeff said they had no problems with anyone in Rookies up until that point. Jeff guessed that TJ would get a ride back to On the Rocks where TJ's truck was. So those were him just going over what he remembered about that night. But um, here's where things get a, a little bit confusing to me, and I'm still not sure that uh, we have a total resolution uh, to this. And I preface this all by saying that I realize that it's been over nine years since this happened, and nobody more than myself knows how people's memories can change over time. They think they remember things that are true, and they might not, might not be true memories. 
this happens. I encounter I encountered this very often. But I asked Jeff about the truck keys. In fact, I asked him about them like three different ways. You'll remember that Tom said that Jeff gave him the keys two days later uh, when they saw each other in person. The thinking was that TJ gave them to Jeff so TJ would be able to avoid drinking and driving. You'll remember that Tom was very clear that although TJ was allowed to drive his truck, Tom surely did not allow TJ to drink and drive on top of the fact, of course, that drinking and driving is illegal. But anyway, Jeff insisted that he never had TJ's keys that night. He could not have been more clear on that. Um, once again, I'm just asking the questions, and that's uh, the way he remembered it. Um, and he was not sure on how Tom could have gotten that second set of keys back. But the problem is, is that the way Jeff remembers it in not having the keys contradicts what Tom remembers and the way Tom puts it contradicts the investigator's notes from 2011. Could Jeff just be forgetting? Absolutely. I'm guessing he was drinking that night and his memory could be foggy. However, Jeff would surely have been sober two days later when Tom did get his keys back from Jeff. Still, Jeff was adamant he never had TJ's keys. Now, as I stated, I did speak to Jeff again as uh, during a follow-up call. Once again, I believe it was on, I think it was the day before my dad and I drove back to Pennsylvania. That was the 30th. So the, December 29th, I spoke to Jeff again. I had called him, left a message. He called me back. In this follow-up conversation... He said that since our first phone call, he had spoken to his mother about uh, talking to me. And during that conversation, I guess the keys, the topic of TJ's keys came up. And Jeff says that his mother reminded him that, yes, he did have TJ's keys. But Jeff still insists that he does not remember that. But he says in talking to his mother, um, they were able, I guess, in my words, to hash that out. I got to be honest with you, I think it's still a bit of a stumper to me. Also, in my discussion with Jeff, uh, you'll remember during the interview with Tom, uh, you heard how Jeff ended up talking to Amanda's mother. We went through that. I asked Jeff how that happened. Jeff said that when he couldn't reach TJ later that day, October 19th, so TJ disappears right after midnight of October 19th, so Jeff finally goes home, goes to bed, gets up the next day, is trying to contact um, TJ and couldn't reach him. Uh, Jeff says that he started calling hospitals, the jails, etc., but he also decided to call bail bonds places. Why? Uh, because TJ had slapped a woman, and I, I, my opinion is maybe Jeff was thinking that, well, Maybe somebody called the cops, and that is uh, assault. It, it could be a felony, and maybe they arrested TJ. So uh, Jeff started calling bail bonds places, and, well, coincidentally, Jeff ended up calling a bail bonds place that was run by Amanda's family. Amanda's mother answered the phone, and when Jeff mentioned TJ Murray and what had happened the night before or earlier that day, very, very early in the morning, Amanda's mother stated, is this the TJ Murray that slapped my daughter last night? Well, if that's true, somebody is going to kill him. It was something, some statement to that effect that Amanda's mother allegedly made to Jeff on the phone on October 19th, 2011. So this would have been roughly... 12 hours, 14 hours after TJ uh, got kicked out of Rookies. So it seems that the story about TJ slapping Amanda got around pretty fast. I don't know how uh, Amanda's mother found out about this. Maybe Amanda told her herself, and we'll get into that in a moment. But it seems like the mother knew less than 12 hours later. 
and I will come back to this conversation with Amanda's mother uh, that Jeff had in a little bit. But that was pretty much the extent of the conversation with Jeff uh, the first time, and I'm going to mention a little bit of my second conversation with him in a bit. I'll tag in on to uh, another conversation that I had. But he seemed to be very open-minded to different possibilities regarding TJ and the disappearance. And yes, one of those theories could be that someone, uh, someone harmed TJ due to what TJ did to Amanda. But uh, Jeff really did, uh, in my opinion, did not really buy into any particular theory very strongly. I, I would say he wasn't very opinionate, opinionated on the topic. Next, on December 22nd, 2020, I got to speak to Amanda. I remind you again, that is not her real name. I left a message at her place of business. Uh, she called me back. I would say within a half hour and we had a very cordial conversation. Um, she says it's been very frustrating over the past nine years because, because she has been questioned over and over and over. And she says her story has remained consistent since day one. She had nothing to do she says she has nothing had nothing to do with TJ's disappearance, and she has no idea if it was foul play or not. Uh, of course, we talked about the slap, and this is what she said. She said that there had been karaoke going on uh, that night. TJ had been singing, and after one of these singing stints, uh, he came over and lay down in the booth next to hers. So not sitting in the booth, but laying down, lying down as if sleeping. Then before Amanda knew it, he was in front of her and slapped her. She says for no reason. Uh, she says that no guys, she said uh, nothing to the effect that any guys came to her defense or anything like that. Uh, a small fight did not break out. Nothing like that. It did not cause a barroom brawl. But TJ was directed to leave and did so. And her story checks out because if you watched uh, Detective Fadi Rizk's interview on YouTube that I directed everybody to watch uh, leading up to this episode being released, he says there's security video from that night that shows TJ walking away from the building alone. Nobody with him, nobody following him. My understanding is there is video regarding the inside of rookies as well. He has not been as forthcoming about what the interior of the bar shows. But uh, in any interviews that I've seen that he has done, I've not seen the video, uh, neither has anybody in TJ's family. But furthermore, Amanda gives alibis for some of the people TJ's father suspects in TJ's disappearance. Uh two of those people being the Bell brothers. Amanda says that they were with her, her for the rest of the night, and she was dating one of them at the time. In addition, an investigation into Amanda and the Bell brothers at the time showed that they actually went to another bar after Rookies, and in fact, I believe that Detective Rizk also talks about that in the interview on YouTube that he did, uh, I think, in April or May of 2020. And thus... It, uh, given that Amanda and these uh, two guys, two brothers, their whereabouts can be accounted for, it seems that they would have had no opportunity to do anything to TJ that night. If the timeline is as we understand it, then they would have had no opportunity uh, to do anything to TJ. Uh, Amanda also backed up Jeff's story. Jeff said he stuck around rookies after the slapping incident. Amanda says she remembers that well. And in fact, the way I remember it in the conversation is she brought it up. I'm not the one that brought that. That's at least the way I remember it, that she brought that up that, you know, Jeff stuck around and I had already knew that because Jeff had told me that a couple days before. So regarding this, uh, coincidental, a conversation that Jeff had with Amanda's mother. I just mentioned it a couple minutes ago. Amanda claims she had, until I brought it up on December 22nd, 2020, 
She had never heard that story before. At, at no time in the last nine years has her mother ever told her about that. Never told her about a call from Jeff in which TJ was mentioned. Amanda was quite sure her mother never mentioned it. Also, just like Jeff mentioned, he was open to the idea that the slap caused TJ's disappearance. Amanda pointed the finger at Jeff as being responsible for TJ's disappearance. Why? Because Jeff had been in the military and military, in her, these are her words, and military men tend to react strongly to women being harmed. That's what Amanda said. Just her opinion. Just like everybody has an opinion on, on this case, Amanda's allowed to have hers too, but that's, um, that was hers. That's what, what she voiced to me. Another theory Amanda mentioned was that TJ was a drug dealer and would carry lots of cash on him. And maybe somebody, somewhat, but he knew that and attacked him when they saw him alone after getting kicked out of rookies. Uh, these are some of the, the theories that, uh, Amanda mentioned. Um, by the way, I did ask Amanda to ask her mother about the alleged call, uh, Jeff made to her mother the day after TJ's disappearance or later in the day of the, of the disappearance. I also asked Amanda to get back to me with that information. I really wanted to know. I wanted to see if I could somehow also verify that Jeff just once again, just accidentally spoke to Amanda's mother that morning. Uh, I am recording this section of this episode on January 4th, 2021. As of right now, recording this, Amanda has not gotten back to me. She hasn't called me. She hasn't texted me. She hasn't emailed me regarding that information. So I'm not sure what to make of that. I think I asked uh, nicely, but she said that she would talk to her mother, uh, but uh, Amanda's not gotten back to me. So that was my talk with Amanda, uh, the woman who got slapped by TJ in the early morning hours of October 19th, 2011, at Rookie's Bar in Spring, Texas. The very next day, December 23rd, so two days before Christmas of 2020, the current investigator responsible for TJ's disappearance, Detective Fadi Rizk, R-I-Z-K, called me. I've already mentioned him a few times. I hope you've watched uh, the interview he did on YouTube in April or May of 2020. I've linked to it at a, in a variety of locations. Since I did not uh, recognize the number uh, that was showing on my phone, I did not pick it up. That's my policy. Uh, he left the message, and uh, after I left, listened to the message, I called him right back. And I have to say, at the time, I took for granted that Tom, TJ's father, had told the detective to call me or had told uh, the detective that we were planning on uh, publicizing this disappearance and doing this episode. However, once I spoke to Tom after I talked to the detective, I discovered Tom had never mentioned myself or unfound to Detective Rizk at all. So my suspicion, I have no proof of this, I'm just telling you what I think, is that Amanda is the one who alerted Detective Rizk that Unfound would be covering TJ's disappearance, especially since the call happened the very day after talking to Amanda. She, of course, would have had my number due to caller ID. This is my, once again, this is my suspicion right now. Why would she call Detective Rizk and tell him about myself and Unfound and give him my phone number. I have no idea. I don't know if they talk often. I don't know if, uh, you know, in his investigation, how many times he's a, had a chance to talk to Amanda. I don't know. But my suspicion right now is that Amanda was the one who gave him my number because it's clear in talking to Tom that he did not. So... Uh, but once again, I did not know all of that. I didn't figure that out or this suspicion didn't build until after I was already done talking to Detective Risk. In fact, 
I, I don't think I found it out, figured it out until like the next day or something. But yet, uh, the detect- detective and I did talk. Uh, I did most of the talking, as you might imagine. Uh, really, he did not offer up much information. And uh, as a general note, this is the reason I don't talk to detectives very often. I get asked that once in a while. Um, Ed, why don't you have more detectives on the program? Because they don't tell you anything. They don't have to tell you anything, so they don't tell you anything. I'm not saying that to be rude, but I'm in the information business. And so people who don't tell me any information uh, don't help. Um, Detectives, they are only looking to take information. They are not looking to give information, especially to the media. However, he was helpful in pointing me to the interview that I've already mentioned a few times he did in early 2020. And I want to talk about that video right at this moment. Uh, I wish I would have had an opportunity to watch the video before talking to the detective. In any case, a couple points in that video caught my ear. Number one, and it was already mentioned, the run-in that TJ and Jeff had at the 19th hole. This is something that Tom and I talked about in the interview. Tom did not know about this until he watched that video. And if I'm remembering correctly, if you watch the video, it's about the 1320 mark, 13 minutes, 20 seconds, where Detective Risk uh, mentions that there wasn't just the slapping incident at Rookies, but something had gone on at the 19th hole as well. Uh, Until Tom watched, uh, TJ's father, Tom, watched that video just at the end of 2020, he had never heard uh, about that. In fact, he didn't even know that interview existed until I told him about it. But uh, Tom did not know about this 19th hole story at all. Now, going back to my conversation with Jeff, he did not mention the converse. He did not mention any problems at the 19th hole at- either when I talked to him on December 20th. But in the follow-up conversation that I had with him on December 29th, so nine days later, I asked him about it, and I told him that, you know, there's this video out there with a detective saying that, you know, there's uh, he has in his notes, at least from whoever the detective was, investigator was in 2011, that Jeff and TJ had problems with somebody at the 19th hole. I asked Jeff about this on December 29th in the in the second conversation. Um, Jeff says that never happened. Jeff says that they had no problems with anybody at the 19th hole at all. The only issue that popped up that night was the slapping of Amanda. He has no idea where that story came from, and frankly, I told Jeff, well, he needs to call Detective Risk, and I think give his side of it, because obviously the police in Spring, Texas, in Montgomery County, believe that something did happen at the 19th hole before the two of them went to Rookies. Remember, it was on the rocks, then the 19th hole, then Rookies, and something allegedly at the second place uh, when the police were looking into all of this, uh, whether in 2011 or more recently, uh, it was discovered that something happened at the 19th hole regarding TJ and, and Jeff as well. So there's that. But Jeff says he's never heard that. Nothing happened. Totally news to him. The second um, thing that caught my ear or my eyes, ears, uh, regarding the the interview that Detective uh, Rizk uh, did was, I was surprised how much of the interview was geared toward the idea that foul play certainly did occur in TJ's disappearance. I'll be interested to hear from all of you whether you uh, heard that as well and whether you're surprised by it or not. Um, and I'm, uh, because I'll be honest, you know I don't do any theorizing on here as far as what I think happened, but in looking at TJ's disappearance, the overall picture, it's not automatically evident to me that foul play is involved. I mean, certainly we've covered a lot of other disappearances on Unfound 
where foul play is much more obvious, and I'm not going to name those. But, um, in fact, I'm open to a wide array of theories regarding TJ's disappearance at this point. And some of those have nothing to do with foul play at all. So to hear the current investigator take part in that kind of conversation, well, I may, I, maybe I should put it this way. I would not say Detective Rizk drove the conversation into that area. What I would say is he kind of just went along with the host's observations that foul play was the only possibility. Because, once again, you need to go to YouTube and uh, watch it for yourself. Whereas, I'm used to inv investigators saying we're open to a long list of possibilities at this time. We're not ruling anything in or out, both of a criminal and non-criminal nature. That's kind of what detectives usually say. Not, not just in disappearances, but uh, murders and rapes. And, uh, you know, they usually leave it very, very wide open as to what they're thinking. Um, but Detective Risk uh, never said that. At no time did he try to rein in the host. No time did he try to steer the, the conversation in a different direction away from foul play uh, and keep the interview just to the facts. Why is that? I don't know. Um, and even if I asked Detective Risk, and I've only talked to him once on December 23rd, 2020, I don't think it'd tell me. And surely there is more theorizing going on in that video than there is in this episode. I think if you watch that video and then you're listening to this episode, you know that i got to believe there's more theorizing going on there than here. But please watch that video and judge it for yourself. So those were the three conversations I had concerning TJ's disappearance in addition to the interview you just heard and my talk uh, kind of off the record with TJ's mother, Janelle. So, where does that leave us? A uh, lot of coverage for this disappearance, probably, um, probably in at least the top five of the most people I've ever spoken to before publishing an episode, surely. So where does that leave us? Well, over the last four years, I've written and talked about coincidences in relation to disappearances. Is some unique occurrence part of the disappearance, or is it just something random that happened at the same time as the disappearance? The best example is Brian Schaefer. Of course, that's a disappearance that we've not covered on Unfound. Is Brian not being seen leaving the ugly tuna in Columbus, Ohio, connected to his disappearance? Or is it something that just happened? 15 years later, still nobody knows. The reason I bring this up is because I kind of think of TJ's disappearance the same way. This is how I personally go about analyzing it. Is the slapping of Amanda connected or not? For all intents and purposes, it seems like it should be. Man slaps woman, man leaves alone, another man or men decide to get revenge for that woman. That scenario is happening all the time. And it doesn't necessarily have to end up in a murder or a disappearance. It could be just a very good uh, butt-kicking uh, that never gets reported to police. Happen happening all the time. So we shouldn't feel bad about it coming into our minds. We're not trying to pin something on Amanda or her friends at all. Our brains simply go to what seems most logical. And it very well could be that a couple guys saw what TJ did and they might have taken it upon themselves. And Amanda to this day may have no knowledge that there were two guys in that bar who thought, who decided they were going to get revenge and she has nothing to do with it. Very, very possible. Yet, logic must be matched to facts. And despite all the conversations I had for this episode, at least publicly, who knows what Detective Rizk himself knows, I'm sure he knows more than any of us, but publicly, there are no facts that really connect what TJ did in Rookies to his disappearance. In fact, for Amanda and any others who have been rumored as suspects over the last nine years, 
they could easily make the argument that TJ's I love you daddy phone call was kind of a goodbye. That TJ was feeling despondent about slapping a woman for no reason and felt horrible about it and it put him in a in a mental state where he might have thought that suicide was a choice. They could make that argument because that call, I love you daddy, is a fact. In fact, uh, the both the foul play and no foul play scenarios for TJ's disappearance are conceivable. Foul play being based on the feeling of revenge and no foul play being based on the emotion guilt. So it seems theories regarding TJ's disappearance could also be dualities. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've been listening to Unfound.